I think we can go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining today's virtual offering of the Library Assessment Conference. Today's presentations are on the theme of services. My name is Elizabeth Edwards and I'm the moderator for today's session. My colleague Marini Strub is my co-moderator. Before we begin, we have a few logistics to share. We have 10 presentations with two 15-minute breaks, one after the first three and another after the next three. Break times are 2.05 to 2.20 p.m. Eastern and 3.20 to 3.35 p.m. Eastern. For those of you on a different time zone, the time now is 1 p.m. Eastern. Each paper presentation will be introduced separately with up to five minutes Q&A for each paper. There will be a few minutes for general questions at the end of the session. Please use the chat feature for technical questions or issues and an ARL staff member will respond. We encourage you to use the chat for discussion with other attendees as well. If you are a Twitter user, please follow the hashtag LAC20. I think there will be a link in the chat for that. Please use the Q&A feature to ask questions of the speakers. Note that we may not be able to address all questions during the time allowed, and if there's time at the very end, we may be able to come back to any final questions. Questions will be read aloud for the audience and answered live by the presenter. And after the individual Q&A, presenters may also type answers to any unanswered questions. The PowerPoint slides, session recordings, and final edited conference papers will be made available by ARL on the conference website. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the conference website as well. Live automated captioning is enabled for this webinar. Please hit the CC button at the bottom of your screen to turn on captions. And a full transcript will accompany the recording about a week or two after the event. Our first paper is Professional Development and Professional Identity, a Qualitative Assessment of the Art of Teaching Program, presented by Chris Markman, the Director of Professional Education at the Tufts Clinical and Translational Science Institute. So Chris, we'll let you take over from here. Chris, I believe you're muted. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> all right, had to find the button. Um, all right, so, and everyone is, I think, seeing my slides now, correct? Yep. Great, <clears throat> so thank you all for um, joining us. Um, so I am uh, Chris Markman, and uh, when I did all of this work, I was at the Harvard Library as a Director of Organizational Learning. Um, so I joined Tufts uh, Clinical and Translational Science Institute in October. So. Um, what I'm presenting to you today is work that was done at Harvard, uh, primarily in 2019. So um, I'm going to talk about a program that we developed for uh, librarians at Harvard, um, a professional development training program. So to start off with just a little bit of background um, about why we were interested particularly in um, teaching and professional development around teaching training. Um, 
In the library literature, it's been long noted for at least a couple of decades now that instruction work is a significant portion of uh, what librarians do in academic libraries. And along with that, though, the there has been a, a recognition that there's tends to be a lack of training in library and information science programs on instruction. Sometimes it's a course or a part of a course. There are a few exceptions where there's a more detailed training, but there's been a fairly uh, significant trend in the literature of noting that uh, librarians often come out of their programs feeling unprepared for the amount and depth of teaching work that they actually have to engage in in their jobs. In addition, in the general literature on professional development and training and in education, there's a lot of work showing how useful professional development programs are also in libraries, and in particular training in pedagogy for improving teaching skills. And people who engage in professional development can increase obviously their efficacy in teaching, increase their skills, increase their confidence. But another interesting um, way that professional development can help is by helping to um, strengthen professional identity and in particular teacher identity. And teacher identity is a concept that's often talked about in education, particularly in K through 12 and somewhat in the uh, higher ed literature. There are some discussions about teacher identity in uh, LIS literature, but um, there have been some good positive linkages to increase teacher identity to teacher efficacy and teaching efficacy. So um, it's not just about the skills, it's also about how one sees oneself as a teacher and how they integrate that teaching into their professional identities and their understanding of who they are as professionals. <clears throat> so a little background about the case of Harvard Library. So Harvard University is a highly decentralized institution. There are 12 degree granting schools. Um, also uh, the Radcliffe Institute, which has a library but does not have a faculty or curriculum. Um, because of the very decentralized nature of Harvard, all of the curriculum development and instructional support tends to also be centered in the schools. And this was very much true pre-COVID. Um, actually, the pandemic sort of slight benefit was to do a little bit more centralized services and, and actually increase some collaboration. But um, as, as far as when we collected these data and when we did this work, that was pretty much the case. Um, so along with the university being highly decentralized, the library itself is also decentralized. There was a reorganization that happened um, and wound up in 2012 that did create a central Harvard Library organization, but there are still, I think officially now the count on the website is 28 libraries across the various professional schools and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, as well as a number of shared services units that are centralized, such as access services and technical services. So all across all of these shared services and 28 libraries, there are more than 700 staff. Um, Harvard, as a sort of very traditional Ivy League institution, also does not grant any formal faculty status to librarians. So all librarians are considered staff in terms of the university's um, categorization. There are a handful of professional school library directors who have kind of a complementary faculty status, but there's nothing centralized or formalized. And because I think of the decentralized nature of the university and the curriculum, there was also at the time that we did this, no formal library instruction program that was centralized and no formal information literacy program. There are various different programs that are systematized to a different extent across the libraries, but nothing that brought everybody together. Um, and as part of the library reorganization, there was a governance structure that started and included a standing committee called the Research, Teaching and Learning Standing Committee, which I was on um, at the time and which drove a lot of the work that I'm gonna to present to you today. <clears throat> So the Art of Teaching for Librarians was a service, this program that we developed, and it came out of conversations from the Research, Teaching and Learning Standing Committee that acknowledged that even though librarians lacked formal recognition for their teaching work and formal teaching status and faculty status, there was nonetheless a significant amount of instruction work happening across all of the libraries, particularly informal teaching, but you know, one shots, orientations, etc. And uh, at the same time, the RTL Standing Committee determined that it was important, given the lack of training um, that has been noted, and also from, you know, suggestions from staff themselves, that we needed additional skill development. Um, and the RTL Standing Committee also felt that it was important to kind of call out this work as teaching, even despite the sort of lack of formal recognition from the university. 
<clears throat> so we developed this idea of a training program for librarians and ran a pilot workshop in January of 2016 in order to sort of gauge um, interest and see where uh, things needed to go. And we had two overall goals based on, again, the recognition that we wanted to help develop practical teaching skills for librarians, but also based in the literature, uh, wanting to help develop a sense of teacher identity as a secondary goal. So we had two structured programs in addition to some one-offs. Um, we had a uh, three-week intensive seminar in July of 2016. And then uh, there was where some revisions happened and we did a, a revamped version of the program in 2019. And so what I'm gonna to present to you today is actually the results, some of the results from an IRB approved study that we did to assess those programs and particularly the differences in the outcomes between those two programs. <clears throat> So our research goals generally were again to understand how well both of those programs worked, how the changes in the structure from 2016 to 2019 might have affected the outcomes, and um, how the training programs might have influenced uh, professional identity and teacher identity. Um, so here we go. Uh, so 2016, our Art of Teaching program, the first iteration. Um, we had 12 applicants uh, who completed the program. In this version, we had an open call across all of the libraries. So anybody who sort of identified as having instruction responsibilities, regardless of what their job title or position was, um, was invited to apply. It was structured over three weeks in the summer and it was really structured as a blended learning experience. So we had three face-to-face -face sessions that were four hours long, one each week, but then there was a significant amount of online work in the form of readings, discussions, and a whole group project that the participants had to work on outside of the formal class meetings. And we also had a teaching presentation, basically a little snippet that they did um, in uh, at the first week and then in the last week to kind of see how they had changed a slice of their teaching. In 2016, we had not done a formal pre and post test, but we did have a, uh, an evaluation that went out after the program ran. Um, and, and overall, the participants were extremely positive about the program. They, uh, this is just a sample of some of the results that we had in our post evaluation. Folks felt very strongly that they gained new skills, that they knew how to apply concepts um, to what they were going to be doing in their roles and very strongly agreed that the seminar should be offered again in the future. In terms of room for feedback, pretty universally what participants felt was that the timing and the duration was too short and too intense. So we had structured it as a short intense program in order to try to minimize the amount of time away from their work that participants would, um, would have to spend. But what folks generally told us was that they thought that shorter class sessions spread out over more weeks and more hands-on work rather than online work would be more beneficial. So we had, uh, we did some one-off sessions in 2017 and we had some leadership changes at the library and we did uh, kind of a real deep dive talking with uh, leadership across the school libraries and the Harvard library and came back and started in 2018 revising what we wanted to do based on the feedback from the 2016 program and also from the interstitial um, individual sessions. And we kind of went in the complete different direction for 2019 and decided, okay, what we'll do is really structure this like a graduate course, essentially. So it came, it rolled out over the entire semester, 14 weeks long, one face-to-face -face session a week, um, three hour meetings. We did have some supplemental online readings and a discussion, but for the most part, the activity focused on the face-to-face -face three hour class sessions. We also structured this with a practicum uh, experience. So participants had to have either a teaching assignment that they were going to be working on, something they were going to do in the future, or maybe something they'd done in the past that they wanted to revamp. And the idea was that they would use that over the course of the whole program to apply all of the different concepts to. The other thing that we changed for 2019 was rather than having it be an open application, we structured it as nominations from supervisors. And one of the reasons is we hoped that having not uh, nominations and having supervisors involved would help make it easier for staff to have the time carved out of their work schedule. 
we were very clear with leadership that we thought that as a professional development offering from the library, it should be something that people should be doing during their work time, that this should be considered work, basically, because we were helping them develop skills that were going to help the library. So um, we had a total of 10 participants in 2019 who completed the whole program. And for this, we did have a pre and post evaluation questionnaire, and we did um, interviews at the end of the program. The study that we did um, has, uh, I'll just kind of skip past the methods here. Again, it was a qualitative study. We'll have all of this outlined in our paper. Um, just to give you a sense of some of the results, from our pre and post test. So we had the 2016 participants who agreed to participate in the study, as well as the 2019 participants um, who agreed to be in the study, take the same survey that the, the post test. Um, interestingly, what we find is that in some cases, uh, folks in 2019 did increase. So they felt more strongly that teaching was an important component of librarianship and that librarianship was important to their professional identity and that librarians are educators. So we felt like that was successfully meeting our goals. Um, but there are some other areas where teaching was rated actually lower after the training than it was before. So particularly, there's some tension between teaching being an important component of librarianship and teaching being an important part of their professional identity, which they actually felt less strongly about after the program. Um, and so, just to kind of go to the interview findings to dive into that a little bit more. Overall, folks had more positive than negative or neutral comments in terms of the training program and their identity. For the folks who really had positive comments, they talked about loving teaching, helping students, really that teaching was tied very strongly into the mission of helping and helping students particularly. Folks who felt positively about teaching also stressed that it was, they felt that it was either a significant portion of their role in terms of time or maybe a small amount of their overall time, but still one of the most important parts of their role. And particularly for the folks who are in our 2016 cohort, many of them mentioned that they already identified as a teacher before they started the program. So they didn't see as much change as just having the program boost what they, how they kind of already saw themselves. When we looked at the uh, interviews who had expressed more negative or neutral uh, perceptions about the program and about teacher identity, um, kind of the flip side. So for those folks, they didn't feel that teaching was necessarily their primary task. Maybe it was something they did, but it wasn't something that they saw as important or core to their work, or it was just sort of what librarians do and not special. And then this one was very interesting, and I think at least has some relationship to the way things are structured at Harvard. Uh, some folks definitely drew a distinction between the work they did, even if it was instruction, and what sort of, quote, real faculty did. And that somehow they didn't feel comfortable acknowledging being a teacher because they weren't officially faculty, even though they do teach all the time. Um, and when we look specifically at the program, um, folks very much thought that it helped them develop their confidence and felt more empowered, they're more empowered in relationships with faculty. Um, particularly in 2016, people felt that it helped them give a name to the work that they uh, were doing already. Um, and one of the things we did see was that the 2019 participants in the study were a little bit less sure about how to apply some of the concepts. Um, and they, they weren't really clear exactly what the impact of the training had been. And uh, so I think uh, my last, last slide, just to wrap up, um, with some of the discussion questions, um, I think some of that things, those things tie in. So things to think about and to consider you know, why did some participants, particularly in 2019, have a lower teacher identity after the training and why did they resist? And I think possibly one explanation is the change that we made from nominations. So in, self, in 2016, they were self-selected. And so in a certain sense, they were motivated to see themselves as teachers because they selected into a professional development program about teaching. Um, it seems like there might've been some folks who were more urged or asked or uh, encouraged to, attend the professional development uh, seminar in 2019, but they maybe really didn't feel as strongly about it as their supervisors did. Um, and so I think also that speaks to the time in terms of the assessment results. So the 2016 uh, participants had a much longer time, obviously, to reflect on what they had did and to think about how they had incorporated what they learned into their work. I think for many of the folks, we did the interviews in 2019, essentially right at the end of the program, and people really had not had enough time to integrate that into their self-concept. 
And then finally, the last uh, thought we have is just the role of organizational structures on professional identity. We have a um, larger uh, study actually that we incorporated where we you know, also interviewed um, librarians at two other uh, public universities where they have different organizational structures. And uh, you know, we've reported that elsewhere, but I do think that we see in our results from Harvard that the way the organization is structured does impact how people see themselves professionally. Um, so I know that we have maybe just a few minutes uh, before the next presentation uh, for questions. Um, here's our contact information. I did forget to put my Twitter handle on there, but I'm easily Googleable. So uh, let's see. Questions are in the yeah. chat. Is that right? Um, nope, they are. We're encouraging folks to put questions in the Q&A box. Oh. So we have one question already in the Q&A, and I do see another question in the chat. The first question from the Q&A was, uh, was the art of teaching a bottom-up initiative led by a steering committee or was it top-down initiated by administration? That's a good question. I mean, a little bit of both. So the steering committee, it came out of the steering committee, but at the time also, I think was very much encouraged by our AUL uh, for research and education at the time. Um, but I think everybody in the standing committee really felt like it was an important project to do. Thank you. And then um, another question from the chat. Um, was there any discussion of offering a small stipend to finish the program to encourage more more folks to apply and then to complete the program? Um, we did have conversations about that, I think, after the second version. So I think we hadn't really thought about thought about that before we did the revamped version, but uh, it did it has come up uh, in post discussions. Thank you. We have time for a couple more questions if there are any. Uh, do you have a sense of whether this program is going to be offered again? Um, I'm not sure, uh, obviously, since I'm not at Harvard anymore. I mean, I think uh, we were really evaluating things and uh, then the pandemic, you know, <laughs> really changed a lot of structures. And I think Harvard itself also went through um, a retirement options. So I think the library itself is in the process of restructuring. So it's not clear to me what the future is going to be for that. I think largely just because of the way COVID kind of upended operations at the university. Sure, that makes sense. And then I think our final question was, um, who led the instruction that was offered in the Art of Teaching program? I'm sorry, I forgot to say that. So <laughs> I was one of the, the, the co-facilitators, facilitators. one of my colleagues who's since retired, Deborah Garson, who was at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, Gutman Library. And then we had, um, in 2019, we also had um, two different facilitators that joined me, uh, Jocelyn Kennedy, the director of the Harvard Law School Library, and Alex Hodges, who was the new then director of the Gutman Library at uh, GSE. Thank you so much. Um, I think we might have time for one more question if there are any. Sorry, I can't use the uh, Q&A because I'm a panelist, but I was just curious, um, Chris, great presentation, thank you. Do you, um, you. Did you have any kind of contact with the Box Center at Harvard that does teaching and learning um, uh, as well, does, does that kind of instruction? I'm just curious how you integrate with uh, uh, units like that on a campus like Harvard. I mean, so that there was some, I mean, I had been, you know, familiar with all those folks through some university committees that I sat on. And one of the reasons actually that we did the program for the library was because the box center is actually specific to the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. So their services aren't really available across the whole university. That's part of that whole decentralized nature. So some of the schools have their own teaching and learning components. So the Box Center is one, there's one at the Harvard Kennedy School, there's also one at the Graduate School of Education, and then there's none at some of the other schools. So we sort of stepped in in order to do something that was equitable and distributable across the entire library system, to, regardless of what school people happen to be at. Thank you so much for those answers. Um, and, and thank you for your presentation, Chris. Thank you. Next. Next up, we have uh, Maria Chiochos, the assessment librarian at the University of Texas at Austin. Maria is not able to join us live today due to the weather and the power outage situation in Texas, so we will be sharing the recording of her presentation 
Impact of Library Collections on Faculty and Researcher Recruitment and Retention Decisions. We will also share her contact information for questions. Uh, we can also collect any questions if you want to submit them in the Q&A box, and then we can pass those on to Maria directly. Hi, my name is Maria Chiochos, and I'm the Assessment Librarian at the University of Texas Libraries. I'm presenting on behalf of my colleagues, Janelle Hedstrom, Katie Pierce Meyer, and Mary Rader, who were a part of the project team. Together, we conducted a study from January 2019 to July 2020 to learn more about how the University of Texas Libraries collections might impact faculty recruitment and retention decisions. This study was initiated by the Association for Research Libraries Research Library Impact Pilots. These pilot projects came out of a series of recommendations made by the Assessment Program Visioning Task Force in an effort to better align the research and analytics work of ARL with the goals and needs of its members. One of the recommendations was to develop a research library impact framework that outlines a fresh set of research actions and data points to collect so that research libraries can communicate the value and relevance of library activities in ways that resonate with stakeholders. This study focused on the collections area of the impact framework and tackled the research question, how do the library's collections play a role in attracting and retaining top researchers and faculty to the institution? The University of Texas Libraries is the only institution to explore this question so far. Before gathering any new data, we first reviewed the literature for insights. We found tons written generally on the return on investment in libraries, on faculty satisfaction and expectations, and on recruitment and retention. We also looked at local information on faculty perceptions and expectations about the University of Texas libraries and our collections from strategic plans, task force reports, and campus-wide surveys. And we learned that the relationship between libraries, their collections, and the specific and effective drivers of faculty career decisions had not previously been studied in depth. We found a couple of local documents that tangentially address the subject of this study, but only one existing journal article from a 1987 study by Clef and Murrah that directly investigated potential connections between collections and career decisions of faculty. With that background in place, we designed a localized study using a two-pronged approach, an online survey and in-person interviews to gather both quantitative and qualitative data. Our survey and interview questions and methodology were developed using the Clef and Murrah study and the Ithaca SNR Research Support Services Program as models. Questions were also informed by trends identified in the literature that indicated that discipline and research methodologies matter. We limited our audience to faculty hired or promoted within the past five years, as we believed that their career decisions would still be recent enough to recall in detail. We sent our Qualtrics survey to 991 newly recruited and promoted faculty, to which we received 284 responses, which is a 29% response rate. For our one-on-one -on -one semi-structured interviews, we recruited 13 faculty members distributed across the arts and humanities, social sciences, and STEM disciplines, and across the assistant, associate, and full professor ranks without overlap in departments to ensure a diversity of viewpoints. Each team member independently coded the interview transcriptions and survey comments. The team then came together to compare and align those independently generated codes into broader categories and to explore the relationships among them as well as with the rest of the survey data. Our analysis of the data revealed four overarching themes. One, access to collections is a priority. Two, assumptions about collections are widespread. Three, local special collections are deeply impactful to certain faculty. And four, factors that influence faculty recruitment and retention are generally personal and multifaceted. As I discuss each of these themes in more detail, I have included direct quotes from our participants on the following slides to illustrate these findings. We begin with our first finding, which is access to collections is a priority. While distinctions between collections themselves and access to them is clear to those of us working in libraries, faculty do not make these same delineations. Our research, especially the qualitative input, 
revealed that faculty expect immediate, preferably unmediated access to information. Across the disciplines, unfettered, seamless, and efficient access to a wide range of materials, both physical and electronic, is important. Interrupted access, by contrast, is not ideal access. While faculty greatly appreciate service efficiency and are willing to use interlibrary loan or to request materials from off-site storage, they do not like having to do so. It changes their workflows, causes delays, and ultimately irritates them. Faculty stated they expect more from R1 institutions of our caliber. Ultimately, if the library cannot provide efficient access, faculty made it clear that they will, and do, go elsewhere to gain access to materials, be that to previous institutions, to peer networks, to social media, and even to sites of pirated material. Going on to our second finding, which is assumptions about collections are widespread. 89% of surveyed faculty reported that considering library collections had not occurred to them during recruitment because they assumed the libraries would have what they needed. This mindset was particularly common among those who identified as scientists and social scientists. Faculty from these communities tend to come from other large research institutions, and they imagine their library experiences will translate seamlessly. As one professor stated, I just need UT to have access to the journals I use, and it's all pretty similar across all R1 universities. For the most part, STEM and social sciences faculty assumptions held true. Faculty from these communities who rely heavily on journals and the occasional book generally emphasized that they were well served by UT Libraries collections. However, the arts and humanities faculty we interviewed were much more sensitive to the possibility that some libraries are better able to support their research than others, and they came to UT Austin with fewer unchecked assumptions. From our survey, 82% of arts and humanities faculty versus 96% of STEM faculty assumed we would have what they need. This is particularly true for those whose research depends on special, unique, and historic collections. That brings us to our third finding, which is local special collections are deeply impactful to certain faculty. Of the 284 faculty surveyed, 72 regularly use archives and special collections in their work, and 108 use foreign language materials. While many participants shared expectations that collections should be on par with other R1 research institutions, several faculty identified the value of special collections to their research and teaching. Faculty members emphasized the value of having multiple collections both on campus and nearby for access to a broad range of documents from early literature and maps to correspondence and newspapers. A few faculty members in the Arts and Humanities and Social Sciences named specific archives on campus, listing these special collections as a major reason why they came to UT. In addition, the close proximity to off-campus libraries and archives that contain government documents, local historical records, and specialized collections are recognized as a tangible benefit of coming to work at the university. In terms of disciplinary differences, Arts and Humanities faculty most clearly articulated how the archives, special collections, and foreign language materials here positively impact their research and teaching and play a significant role in engaging students in the research process. Several faculty members spoke to the importance of having robust foreign language materials in the collections. Other faculty had discovered and were somewhat surprised by the depth of the collections in areas related to their research and the benefit of having access to physical copies of materials that are not readily available online, such as our UN documents. The role of librarians and other faculty who have worked to build these strong aggregations of materials over time was recognized as a significant resource to have access to. And now we move on to our last finding, which is the factors that influence faculty recruitment and retention are generally personal and multifaceted. When asked about their reasons for coming to or staying at UT, 57% of faculty surveyed and nine interviewees said our collections did not drive their decision to come work at the university. The factors they listed were individual and wide ranging. Of the faculty that had been offered positions elsewhere but declined to go, a majority stated the library collections were not a factor in their decision either. 
This isn't to say that our collections don't play a role at all in faculty recruitment and retention. 42% of faculty surveyed and four interviewees expressed that UT Libraries collections were a driver in their decision to come work at the university. Many faculty described our collections as important to their research and teaching efforts, and a slight majority of faculty who were actively seeking a position elsewhere reported the quality of the library collections will be a factor in their decision. When looking at the breakdowns of these responses by discipline and methodological practices, our collections played a much larger role in the recruitment and retention decisions of faculty that regularly use archival, special collections, or international and foreign language materials, or for faculty who are in the arts and humanities and to a degree in the social sciences too. Based on these findings, we have three big takeaways in response to our research question of how do the library's collections play a role in attracting and retaining top researchers and faculty to the institution. The first takeaway is the connection between our collections and faculty decisions to join or remain at UT Austin was not a direct relationship usually, but they do appear to play a role for some faculty. Like Clough and Murrah's research over 30 years ago, faculty believe library resources to be critical to their professional success, productivity, and overall satisfaction. But those same resources are not always explicitly considered in their decision making to come to or to stay at an institution. The second takeaway is our research suggests that UT Libraries collections could become more of a driving force for future career decisions of some faculty. Many faculty express that they have come to appreciate UT Libraries since coming to UT. They overlooked including the library in their decision criteria regardless of its importance. They will add the library to their decision criteria if they seek a position elsewhere, and they will see it as a problem if the quality of and our access to UT Libraries collections declined. The third takeaway is faculty possess strong ideas about what the libraries and our collections represent, which could factor into their retention decisions. Faculty talked about the essential value UT Libraries provides for both teaching and research endeavors. They shared their concern around this value being diminished if UT Libraries is not made a campus budgeting priority. They expressed the growing importance for UT to signal its commitment to and investment in UT Libraries. And faculty perceived a link between investment in UT Libraries and UT's overall research and teaching mission. Some faculty went as far to say that if they don't see more investment in UT Libraries, then that will be a significant factor in their decision of whether or not to remain at UT. For them, the most visible symbol of this investment is in the collections, as faculty members repeatedly equated the libraries with our collections. So that concludes my presentation today on how library collections might impact faculty recruitment and retention decisions. I'm excited to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Once again, Maria is not able to be with us today to take questions live, but we have shared her email address in the chat. Um, if you do have questions you would like to enter now, um, you can put them in the Q&A and we'll collect them and pass them on to her for follow up. Um, and with, with thanks to the flexibility of our next presenters, um, we're going to turn it over to the next presentation, assessing the role of reference, prioritizing users and emphasizing critical thinking and collaborative workflows presented by Jasmine Spittler, Assessment Librarian at George Mason University, Ashley Blindstrom, Student Success and Inclusion Librarian at George Mason University, and Melanie Bopp, Head of Access Services at George Mason University. Hi, thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yep, you sound great. Perfect. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me and my colleagues. Uh, we're here to present assessing the role of reference, prioritizing users, and emphasizing critical thinking and collaborative workflows. Uh, my name is Jasmine Spittler. I'm the assessment librarian at George Mason University, and I've been in this position for the past year and a half, and I'm going to let my colleagues introduce themselves. Hello, everybody. My name is Ashley Blinstrup. I am the Student Success and Inclusion Librarian, and I have also been in my position for a year and a half. And I am Melanie Bach. I'm Head Access Services at George Mason, and I have 
hit just over a year at, at Mason Libraries. So in today's session, you will learn how to talk about our collaborative process of designing an assessment project across the different library departments and to examine the issues surrounding reference questions impact on access services and subject librarians. Next slide, please. So today we're going to start by going over the background and history of the topic, explain our literature review, and then dive into our research project. And I will hand it over to Melanie to give you some background information. So George Mason is an R1 public university in Northern Virginia. At the time of this particular study, Mason had approximately 39,000 students enrolled across three different campuses in Virginia. Um, the, the study that we did was at the largest campus of those in Fairfax. Next slide, please. We would like to take a moment to acknowledge that the land that George Mason University sits on in Virginia occupies the traditional land of the Manahoke, who merged with the Chutflos and Saponis, and the Nacochteg and Acostan tribes. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to the land on which we live and work. We do this to reaffirm our commitment to learn the history and to honor the lives of all who endured and continue to endure settler oppression and white supremacy. And now I'll turn it back over to Ashley for some more project info. Yes, so to give you some background information about reference at George Mason University, I would like to start off by saying we have only been here for a year to a year and a half. So none of us were here during this um, historical perspective. So we had to gather this by interviewing lots of folks in access services and subject librarians. But prior to 2016, the library had a traditional reference model with librarians sitting at a desk to answer reference questions. That changed in 2016 when the library was renovated and moved to a single service point between access services and reference. This included the creation of a new team called Information Services who staffed the desk to answer reference questions. Access services and information services were two separate departments, but worked at the same service point. In 2018, there was another reorganization of our staffing structure of the library and information services was dissolved and moved to the teaching and learning team. Uh, which was not located in the main library and they ran a branch library on campuses. The former information services was given more teaching duties as well as reference services at the branch library. In the main library, access services solely staffed the information desk with subject librarians taking appointments in their area to help students with research and students asking reference questions via the library's chat service. And there was no formalized reference at the information desk. And now I will turn it over to Jasmine to talk about our literature review. So in the, uh, in the beginning, so to speak, Ford first proposed in 1986 that libraries restructure their reference services uh, due to anticipated changes in library user behavior with new advancements in technology. And then the first paramount reference assessment was done by Gerlich and Burrard in 2007, where the reference effort assessment data scale, or better known as the Reed scale, was developed. This established a baseline to evaluate qualitative statistics for academic reference services. As a result of all these discussions and changes in academic libraries over the years, many have experimented with different reference service models. There are many that have moved to merged desks or single service points. Some have reorganized access services departments entirely with the main goal of meeting user needs more readily. And others have instituted peer reference models where student peers work to answer reference questions. 
So this brings us to the methods that we used for this study. So in fall 2019, we created a representative task force to include all of the stakeholders, including managers, subject librarians, and access services staff. We defined three different levels of questions based on a modified read scale. So tier level one questions were designated as directional, tier level two were reference, and tier level three were research consultations. We strategically chose eight weeks in the semester for the data collection to occur based on previous year's data. Data collection took place both at the information desk via a web form, as well as a weekly spreadsheet, and with on-call librarians through a community spreadsheet. Responses included level of questions that were asked, as well as any referrals. After all of the data collection was finished, we held three open feedback sessions to hear from staff that provided the service over the semester. So now we're at our findings. Uh, sorry, technical difficulty. Uh, there were 1,901 uh, interactions logged by Fenwick Access Services staff, though most of these were tier level one or directional. Out of these, 145 information desk interactions were referred to librarians on call. However, there were only 56 interactions logged by librarians on call, meaning that there was a 61% drop off rate of patrons who were referred but did not follow up on the referral. Of the interactions logged by on call librarians, 17 were recorded as tier level two, so about 30%, and 33 were recorded as tier level three, so about 59%. 38% or 21 of the on-call interactions resulted in a referral to the appropriate subject librarian, which means that these students were double referred. 4.6 or 88 tier levels two and three interactions logged at the information desk were flagged as unable to be referred because they took place outside of reference on call and virtual reference hours. So as you can see here, data collection also revealed useful information regarding staffing times. This chart shows the number of interactions by time of day recorded at the information desk based on the hours the desk is open. Between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. was found to be generally the busiest times, while the least busy was between 8 p.m. and 12 a.m. And then here you can see the number of interactions by time of day logged by librarians on call based on the hours the service was provided from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. This correlates with the desk data with 1 p.m. having the most interactions. 4 p.m. was the least busy time according to the on-call data. After all of the data collection was finished, we held three open feedback sessions to hear from staff who provided the service. There was a general consensus among librarians and library staff that the main library Fenwick should provide some reference service. However, coverage and staffing of the reference on call service in this form was difficult to manage. There were no official venues of communication between access services staff and on call librarians. There was also no central location for the service to be provided. Some did their on-call hours in their offices while traveling librarians from other Mason libraries had no sufficient workspace to provide the service. And from this, I'm going to hand it off to Melanie to talk about practical implica implications and recommendations. Thank you. Okay, so next one. Thank you. Okay, um, so based on the feedback and the data that we received from all of the, the information gathered, um, we had a few suggested recommendations to begin. First, to make the hours more strategic based on said data. Uh, second, to look at creating that central location for research consultations so that it wasn't stuck with librarian office or whatever space a traveling librarian might be able to find. Um, we also needed to define an official communication workflow specifically between the desk and the librarians covering on call so that there was a way for desk staff to get in touch with somebody or vice versa as needed. And then we also decided that managers would need to continually monitor the changes um, throughout the semester to help facilitate those cross departmental conversations. Next slide please. 
So based on those suggested recommendations, we did just that. So first we moved the on-call hours to the high traffic times, and we scheduled librarians for on-call shifts during those times, specifically around the lunchtime hours. Um, we also co-opted a student study room that was right near the information desk as a designated reference on call space. It was pretty ideal both in terms of just physical location but also visibility. So it was very easy for staff to refer people to the room 10 steps that way. Um, and all glassed in reference librarians were visible and it really helped facilitate the, the students adjusting to that. We also had planned out the communication workflow between the involved departments. Um, we started using our internal instant messaging service to communicate between the desk staff and the on-call librarians. Um, we did begin conversations on further assessment, such as looking at the Qualtrics forms that we use for both the info desk data and the public services form for the librarians. Um, alongside all of those, in addition, we had started the process to include some peer referral coaches from our student workers. Staff had outlined a proposal and a training plan at the beginning of spring 2020, which was quickly put on pause due to closures from COVID-19. Next slide, please. And now everybody's favorite. COVID-19. COVID so while we did begin changes and collect some data from spring, um, COVID-19 quickly derailed those plans. Our library and Mason campuses shut down at the end of March and the beginning of April. Um, and so as a result, interdepartmental meetings were delayed and reference and instruction moved 100% online. The peer referral coaches I mentioned previously have also been redeployed in virtual reference so that we are still making use of the training program and the student workers, but not quite in the way we had planned. Um, we also have had to, as a result, close the on-call librarian space. It is simply too small to have more than one person at a time, and we are limiting the number of people in individual rooms when we're on site. That said, we also just have a fraction of our normal traffic. On average, we are seeing maybe 20% of our normal traffic on site for a regular semester, and most of our students are going through the, the virtual reference and other online options. So we don't really know what's going to happen next. We can't predict when COVID-19 will end and what our nor new normal will be, but we are prepared to shift and adjust as the world does. And we're looking forward to a time when library activities can resume in full. Next slide, please, Jasmine. And in case you are curious about any of the resources that Jasmine mentioned earlier, here is a list from our literature review. And then next slide. Again, if you have any questions that come up later, please don't hesitate to shoot us an email and get in touch. We're more than happy to help. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, again, please use the Q&A function and I will read the question for the speaker and the audience. Our first question was, um, for those in access services, were they given additional training to cover the low level reference questions, such as how to find a book or a simple subject search? Um, the questioner's library underwent a similar change and their circulation staff were given training to answer those types of questions. Uh, I will take this one. Now, I will preface this by saying that this training does predate my start at Mason, but there was some uh, some training given to the desk staff, access services staff, and the, the information services team um, at the same time to cover some of the basic reference questions and to, to hopefully help them identify when something needs to be referred versus something that can be answered directly at the desk. Thank you. Could you say a little bit more about how the peer referral program pivoted online when you when uh, services had to close for COVID-19? 
I can talk about that. Um, I worked with them a lot. So we were in the beginning of their training process where we had them working through uh, reference questions with um, reference librarians. And we would go through and tra train them, mostly training them on how to recognize when it's time to refer because we have noticed that that is one of the things our students struggle with the most is helping a student and not realizing that they need to talk to a subject librarian. So we started our meetings in person and then in March we were all sent home and so we started meeting with the students via Zoom instead of in person and would kind of mock reference question with them via Zoom instead. Thank you. Looks like we have a few more questions coming in. Um, overall, how have these service changes been received by staff? Well, I can speak for Access Services staff and say that we, in general, love them. Um, it is fabulous for, for staff at the desk, staff and our student workers at the desk, when we're on site to be able to say, okay, I can get you this far, but I have somebody waiting in the wings who can take you to the next step that you need um, without having to go back and say, okay, well, I can't help you, but here's the email for the person that you actually need to talk to. Um, it also allows the librarians who are on call to do a bit of triage of their own because desk staff can't always tell whether or not the question needs to be handled by a librarian or by a subject specific librarian and there are just too many uh too many variables in there to routinely and fully train access services staff to consistently recognize that that makes a lot of sense um, another follow up question, if patrons were referred to a librarian, would they have to call or email their questions or would access services staff contact the on call librarian to let them know that a referral is on the way. So we would generally try and contact the, uh, the online librarian to ensure that they were physically at the desk in their office wherever they they had said they were going to be um, and hadn't just stepped out for a moment. Um, to try and like avoid having the student take too many different steps to get to the person they, they needed to speak with. Generally, the librarian would be in the, the new reference on call office that we started. God, it's been a year now. <laughs> it was there for like two months. Um, but having the librarian physically right there was incredibly useful for us to be able to literally point a finger and say, this person can help you. And if there wasn't somebody there, if we did have to refer them outside later, we'd give them an email address and a phone number and say, well, they're usually around here like at these times, or they'll be on the, the on-call desk later if you wanna come back. We tried to give as many ways to get in contact as possible. Thank you. Um, what outreach to faculty do you have to do to promote these modes of reference instruction? Um, so we, I guess we haven't done outreach for reference on call just to be frank um it's mostly not marketed uh because it's a new service right now we do have correct me if i'm wrong uh melanie and ashley but i do believe right before we all left there was signage for the uh reference on call space but that's about as much marketing as we did yeah, we had signage on um, the, the co-opted study room that I mentioned earlier. Um, and we also had at the information desk a little handout we could give people to either put what time a librarian was going to be there or put any other details like an email address that uh, that would help the student. And I know people were hesitant to do a ton of outreach while this was a pilot program in case it didn't continue or it continued drastically. And then when everything shut down again, we stopped promoting it, but we were in talks on how we were going to promote it to faculty and students uh, before we went home. Thank you. 
When creating a central service point, did you include tech services staff at all? Um, not really. Generally speaking, it is access services. There was, um, when it was still the information services desk, it was combined with some reference, but tech services or ITS weren't really part of that. And how different is having an on-call space or room from a reference desk? One, one commenter indicated that it does still sound very similar. It is pretty similar. Um, it, it is both the same, but also more of an option for having a, a specified place. With Mason, um, we have, like I had mentioned at the very beginning of our presentation, we have three different campuses in Virginia. And a lot of our librarians will travel in between those different campuses. But when they get to the Fairfax campus and the main library, they don't necessarily have an office or desk space that is just theirs. So they're not going to have a place that they can call students to for a reference consultation or even just for an on call shift. They just kind of hang around the access services desk and try and help people over off to one side, which, while great and we appreciated it, it was also not very convenient to do at the desk. Generally speaking, an access services desk is not built for a reference interaction. Those are much more in-depth, longer conversations. And, and the front desk is just not a good place for that. Um, but we did have some librarians who were using it as like an office space for on-call when they were coming from a different campus. We had some librarians who were like, well, I could be in my office, but I want to get out of my office. So I'm going to go sit in the on-call office for a bit. We also had some librarians who were like, I'm on call, but I'm in my office, just send people upstairs and let me know. So it basically was just a way for us to provide another space that librarians could use to reach the students. And one that was physically, visibly close and accessible. That makes sense. Um, do members of the formerly separate departments report more communication and collaboration after the change, like more librarian staff communication or collaboration? And are there uh, debriefs or group meetings? Um, not really. Oh. So, so in my mind, this is kind of a twofold question, like part one is pre COVID and part two is now. Um, and right now there's not really much of that going on. Um, we're, we're not having too many interdepartmental meetings um, for, for any kind of frontline services, because right now the frontline services are solely access services. Um, previously, we didn't I wouldn't say we had meetings per se between some of the different departments, but there were various training options and meetings that involved both of the departments, but weren't specifically about desk services, if that makes sense. And Ashley, I don't, you were here for what, six months longer than me. <laughs> you might remember some that I don't. I was going to say that Jasmine hosted a lot of conversations between everyone that I thought really helped everybody understand where other folks were coming from. Um, because before that, we had pretty much just didn't know where everything was coming from. Everything was hearsay, rumors. I heard that this person said this. And we were able to all get into a room and discuss what are the issues with this. Yeah, if I can just speak about that a little bit really quickly. Um, so when I first got to Mason, um, I kind of realized that we needed to do some more collaboration but amongst departments, specifically with access services and anyone providing reference. So that's kind of what inspired this whole project and study. Um, and I think having the open feedback sessions at the end of all the data collection really helped open the floodgates of what everybody was thinking and how people could, you know, step into another perspective and work together. Thank you so much. And thank you to our, our participants for all of the questions. Now we're going to be taking our first 15 minute break. Um, we'll be playing some background music as your auditory cue to come back and the next presentation will start at 20 minutes after the hour. Again, thank you to our speakers from the first, first segment.
Now with Taco Bell's app, you can build the box Okay, welcome back from our break. Um, let's see. So our next presentation is titled Looking Deeply at Journey Points and Disciplinary Discourse Practices in Support of Graduate Education. It will be presented by Elizabeth Klein, Research and Learning Librarian at the University of Arizona. So over to you, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, I believe you're still muted. I'm sorry, is that better? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, thank you. I had already started my presentation. I'm so sorry. So I'm going to back up again and start again. <laughs> so first of all, I want to thank everybody for that is behind this conference. I want to thank you for tuning into this uh, amazing uh, series of presentations today. Um, I'm so excited to be with you today. My name is Elizabeth Klein. I am at the University of Arizona. I'm a research librarian here currently, and I'm coming to you live from Tucson, Arizona. So um, with that, we're going to go ahead and start that presentation. Okay, here's an outline of the six main themes that I will cover throughout my presentation today. You'll see me go through each one of these and then uh, hopefully take some questions at the very end. So with that in mind, I'm going to start with a quick overview of the study. Uh, the main purpose of the study was to explore what influences the successful transformation of graduate students research identity in order for libraries to create a more seamless experience during their educational training. This study takes a different approach from previous studies in its framing of discussions with faculty. The data that gathered was used to compile a detailed map of the processes and requirements that make up graduate education. This approach to the data helped to identify what faculty perceive as the greatest struggles for graduate students and to provide evidence of the key places within intellectual journeys of graduate students to identify areas for libraries to focus their efforts to establish missing support structures. Now embedded in that notion is the guiding principle of disciplinary discourse practices. In every discipline, there are practices that exemplify the attitudes, behaviors, tools and activities, and cultures that shape and represent a discipline and enable effective engage, engagement with others in that community. In the context of graduate education, disciplinary discourse practices are comparable to the socialization that happens along the path to professionalism within a discipline. Discourse practices differ between disciplines and for that reason, logically teasing out the activities and engagements that happens in particular disciplines can provide ideas for alleviating structures encountered by students in order to help them to the professionalism necessary to become independent scholars and to develop better uh, services needed. We held our long one-on-one -on -one semi-structured interviews with faculty. 22 faculty from a variety of disciplines participated in the study 
The only requirement was um, knowledge of graduate curriculum and requirements and that they have uh, experienced mentoring graduate students through their graduate training. Discussions were recorded, audio recorded, transcribed, and then encoded in in vivo. Continuous review of the data continued until themes emerged. The research design purposely avoided surveying users about needs, as well as querying about library services. Instead, this study utilized journey maps, a practice adopted from user research, which concentrates on placing a lens on a user's interactions in order to understand the totality of the graduate educational experience. The construct of these came from extensive liaison experience, serving a diverse graduate student base, as well as familiarity with academic requirements in graduate education. Journey models served in several ways. They helped faculty visualize the graduate processes in the graduate educational enterprise. They served as communication tools to flowchart interactions that students carry out and they serve to gently guide discussions during interviews. As you can see, the flexibility of these visuals allowed faculty to move, add, edit, or delete activities that later helped generate a clearer picture of the graduate educational enterprise. The graduate educational training moves along a commonly structured path from acceptance to graduation. The conditions for granting a higher ed degree confirm that students have progressed through one or all of the following stages, uh, educational stages, coursework, exams, research, and theses, as can be seen in this next graphic. Here is a representation of the intellectual journeys in graduate education, detailing roles common time information, information to extract from this picture are the number of journeys and when they take place. Also of note is that some journeys overlap, sometimes two occurring at any one time. The variety of roles or types of identities adopted by graduate students and how they flow throughout the training. The central positioning of multimodal communication because it occurs at all stages. This includes traditional, oral and written, and non-traditional modes such as podcasts and videos. And finally, the committee assessments, which takes place at three different points in time during the exam, research, and thesis sta uh, stages. When it comes to intellectual challenges, there were four areas noted by faculty where students struggle. I'm going to take these one by one. The first area exams. This was per the period noted by faculty as the most stress inducing time of all. One thing that came out of the interviews was the variety of methodologies that existed across depart departments for preparing for exams. Some departments indicated that committees specifically called the literature to the students attention. Others shared that testing material came from classes students took or that material for exams might be joint, jointly chosen by committee and student. It was common to, for faculty to refer to this exam related literature as reading lists. Now, when it came to testing, format also varied widely. Some exams took place over a day or more and were timed. Others were take home and returned af after a period of time, around two weeks or so. The length of the essay of the essays varied by format as well. The take home obviously were a little bit uh, notably longer than the uh, timed exams. Uh, the take homes were usually 15 pages or more. So the problem, there are too many methods. The volume of reading is overwhelming to the students. They don't know how to study for exams. They don't know what material to focus on. They don't know how to compose essays and they're lacking format and structure. There is lost productivity. Some students can take as long as a year to prepare for the exams, which can slow or halt other journeys in the, um, in the process. There is a tendency to delay exams and it is the first major assessment point. Second, during the oral component of the examination journey, the student begins to introduce the research topic and also position their topic within the scholarly landscape of the discipline. Faculty indicated how crucial this step is in graduate education and bluntly stated 
that if a PhD student has trouble coming up with ideas, they probably shouldn't be a PhD student because that is essentially their job to find out what's missing and what's interesting. So the problem, this is the most common place of attrition for students, they are tired and stressed. This intellectual journey is closely connected to and simultaneously takes place within the examination period. Students fail to use the exam exercise to explore and hone a research direction that will yield a focused research topic. And it is the second major assessment point. Committee members are keenly looking for development in the form of independent ideas. The third area, transition from st student to independent researcher. This is now the point where students take over and must ex execute the work. It is like project planning and management. So right-sizing the project, applying the right theoretical frameworks, keeping progress, securing and, securing and handling resources, gathering and analyzing data, managing and resolving all issues that come up. A faculty member recalled that it was a tough, uh, the transition of uh, becoming a, uh, a from student to research independent researcher is also a hard thing that she sees in her students. The transition from doing classwork to doing your own work, the independent stuff and to find th theoretical frameworks that are going to inform the work that you do. So the problem, no structural, no, no structure is provided to the student. The expectation is to figure out discourse practices on their own without much training. They are working in isolation regardless of the discipline. Issues never faced before arise and test their resolve as they experience frequent failures often associated with research. There's no support provided. Mentor and committee, mem committee members completely back off at this stage. There is no support provided, of course, unless initiated by the student, which most don't because they often feel that they should know how to do these things or are afraid or embarrassed to ask for help. They simply can't identify the problem or much less a solution. And similar to the exam phase, they just ignore the situation, they focus on something else, they let things prolong or struggle in isolation. Finally, the fourth, uh, uh, issue in write, was writing. It was the most commonly cited struggle by all disciplinary faculty. The problem, curricular assignments such as lab re reports, critical essays, or research papers do not provide the scholarly writing skills or uh, ex skills expected in the discipline. Students struggle mightily to craft a succinct and clear scientific argument, and students cannot envision being a write, uh, an author and a reader at the same time. Writing support was also listed as the most common uh, time consuming mentor activity. So how can libraries support graduate education through these hardship areas? In the exam area, librarians can learn more about exams in their science disciplines and develop pedagogically based guides to assist students in their studying. This is a significant phase because committee members consider it foundational for the ideation step, which should lead directly to the graduate student's dissertation. If students fail to work through this part of the journey efficiently, they not only add time to completing their degree, but they also have a higher chance of floundering and compounding to their stress levels. Methodologies to help graduate students synthesize readings and approach writing practice essays will help students immensely as they will help, as they will help them deal with stress and have a positive impact in time to degree. In the second area, librarians can develop activities to aid with discovering and exploring topics. The main message not getting to students is that the exam is an exercise to help explore areas of interest that can be brought back to committee and mentors or mentor. This is the point where most students struggle and leave their programs. So librarians are in a position to help with retention. For the transition phase, journey maps can serve as a project management tools. Activities can be broken down. Students can assign timelines. 
These maps can serve to help identify issues or needs that can be discussed with mentor and or committee. They will give students the guidance and confidence needed to feel most, more secure in their work and solidify their research identity, not to mention keep them on track to graduate on time. And finally, for writing, the last area, librarians have the skills to develop toolkits such as libguides with resources or exercise or exercises or develop workshops that will aid students with their scholarly writing. So on to some takeaways. Faculty that, are well, that were well versed in the graduate educational and, and here on this page you see a uh, it's just an Excel uh, uh, file with uh, the different journeys which can be easily edited. So these, can be teased, these maps can be teased out to gather disciplinary discourse practices in a program to establish appropriate support systems. Journey maps can be used as a com communication tool between student, mentor, and committee members to assess progress, help plan work, help identify barriers, and find solutions. During the interviews, one faculty member immediately noticed the value of the visual tool for both stakeholders and said, this is so great. I've actually been thinking about this a lot lately because I do interdisciplinary work with colleagues from completely different disciplines. And as we think about how we mentor students together, it turns out our students may have really different paths through these programs. Next, one untapped, untapped strategy for libraries would be to directly connect with dissertation committees to promote library services. The scholars that make up the graduate committee rest at the center of critical stages in graduate education. Generating a timeline for the occurrence of key disciplinary journeys will help prepare librarians to offer assistance at the right time when students experience most typical hardships in their critical developmental stages. It would be wise for libraries to invest time in considering when the appropriate time is to reach graduate students with information and services that support their academic activities within the various intellectual journeys. And finally, it is advantageous to use language that ties to intellectual journeys of the graduate educational enterprise, which will give a higher chance of resonating with intended users. And with that, I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I will gladly um, take them. Thank you, Elizabeth. And again, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box so that we can make sure that we get them all to Elizabeth's attention. I would be interested in hearing a little bit more about, uh, you mentioned the prospect of creating pedagogically based guides to support students as they prepare for their exams. Mm -hmm. uh, have any of those been created and uh, what has the response been? That's a very good question. So this study took place in 2019. The final data was uh, co compiled and analyzed at the fall of 2019 and then 2020 hit. Uh, which really halted a lot of the uh, proposed uh, 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 suggested approaches in this in this study. So um, that is what uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do next. There were um, some very interesting, uh, obviously, you know, a lot of successes in different departments and learning from those departments will really help uh, uh, give ideas and, and, and guidance on, 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 on other programs that do not have that kind of support. Um, currently for students. Thank you. And what, the follow-up to question to that was, were there particular discipline, disciplines that you have found responded best to this kinds of uh, kind of librarian intervention or support? Oh, good. Um, I, I'm going to, going to say probably the departments that do not have structures in place right now. There are some departments that have fabulous support uh, structures for the students. But uh, equally so, there's a lot of departments that just don't have the, the resources uh, uh, in place right now, the programming, uh, the bandwidth to do a lot of these things. So those departments will really um, 
uh, benefit. And, and it, it, it's a mixture of both. Uh, I would say the humanities and some social sciences pr primarily. But in the sciences, it, a lot of interdisciplinary ones are the ones that really need a lot of the help because they don't really, uh, they need it to, to be uh, put together, if you will. Sure, that makes sense. And I think the example you gave at the end of, of folks doing interdisciplinary work and needing to make visible the, the different traject different checkpoints in the sure. process, I could see that being really, really uh, meaningful. Um, our final question is, do you think much of your findings on grad students would apply to, I, I believe, upper level undergraduate students? Oh, I had not thought about that. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't see why it would not apply in a different context. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, I, I, I'm going to have to give that some thought, but uh, yeah, in this case, my mind was just thinking about graduate students, but uh, definitely I, I see a lot of application a lot in, 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 in other areas too, I suppose. Thank you. We have time for possibly one more question before we move on to our next speaker. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions in the Q&A. So thank you, Elizabeth. We're gonna move on to our next speaker. Um, next up, we have implementing rapid assessment to evaluate e-resource subscriptions for an immediate cancellation project presented by Teresa Carlson, Associate Librarian, Teaching, Learning and Research Services at Northern Arizona University. Teresa? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. And you can see, can you see my slides? I can see your slides and also the speaker notes. Oh, uh, well. How's that? That looks right. Okay, thank you. So, as the pandemic has continued to surge over the past year, many academic libraries are bracing themselves for impending budget cuts. This on top of, for many, stagnant acquisition budgets and rising resource costs. This was the situation where I work at Northern Arizona University's Klein Library. In this talk, I hope to discuss the use of a rapid assessment procedure that we use to make time sensitive cancellation recommendations to address a half million dollar over expenditure. Using this method enabled a small yet diverse team of librarians to make data and stakeholder informed recommendations. I want to start by telling you a bit about Northern Arizona University. We are located in Flagstaff, Arizona, about 80 miles south of the Grand Canyon. NAU is one of three state universities in Arizona. We offer 95 undergraduate degree programs, 76 graduate degree programs, 16 doctoral programs, and many different certific certificates. Enrollment is approximately 30,000 students spread across 20 campuses in online programs. Klein Library is the sole campus, <clears throat> excuse me, Klein Library is the sole library on campus, supporting and serving international and multidisciplinary research. The library is organized into five main departments, administration, content discovery and delivery services, special collections and archives, teaching, learning and research services, and user services and experiences. The number of employees in each department is listed on the slide. Over the past two years, a wave of retirements and departures has led to a decrease in staff of 14 people, which is 25% of our workforce. It was this situation that created a need for a cross-departmental team to review our e-resources expenditures. The driving factor behind the review was to realign the library's acquisition spending with the library's actual acquisition budget. In brief, the library had been using salary savings and other local accounts to supplement a stagnant acquisitions budget, which is very much an unsustainable approach. In spring uh, 2019, the newly formed e-resources group was charged with identifying at least $500,000 worth of e-resource content to cancel over the next eight months. Midway through the project and fiscal year, the university also requested an additional $200,000 budget holdback. Like many libraries, our acquisitions budget was predominantly used for electronic resources, including big deal journal packages, databases, eBooks, et cetera. 
the library had already shifted most funding away from print resources a number of years ago. The time sensitive nature of the project combined with an interdisciplinary team that needed to produce informed recommendations created an opportunity to use the research expertise of librarians who had rapid assessment training and experience. The e-resources group had two main objectives as we worked toward our $500,000 budget reduction goal. First, we needed to complete a thorough electronic resource collection analysis. It had been many years since this type of analysis had taken place. Starting in 2008, collection decisions were separated from subject librarians. We needed this analysis to help us to understand how the existing collection supported teaching and research and to see which parts of the collection were being used and which parts had become obsolete. Second, we felt it was imperative to include feedback about our acquisitions from key stakeholders, specifically faculty and subject librarians. We were committed to involving both groups in the decision-making process because we wanted to understand how they were using the collections. Adding this feedback into our overall methodology helped us to keep from relying solely on cost per use metrics, which would be unfair to smaller programs with fewer students and researchers. Rapid assessment is a research tool and a research method. Rapid assessment procedures were first used over 50 years ago in rural development and rural agricultural product projects. Today, it is considered a well-regarded research tool and is often used to address time-sensitive public health and healthcare-related projects. Its greatest benefit is that it enables researchers to develop an initial understanding of a situation in a short amount of time, which is what we were faced with. In brief, it is a scan of people and resources so you know what and who you are working with. Key aspects of a rapid assessment made it ideal for our time-sensitive project. In our case, a rapid assessment also became a framework which enabled flexible roles to emerge. Recognizing the diverse skills skill set of team members allowed for an efficient delegation of tasks, which were assigned based on an individual team member's availability, skills, and interest. And importantly for members of our group, applying a rapid assessment procedure made the project feel more authentic and research-based rather than existing as a temporary project team. Our process began with developing objectives to meet our budget goal and fitting that within a timeline, somewhat similar to backwards planning. From our environmental scan, we created a list of additional information we needed, things such as updated and accurate user statistics, developing a communication plan and constructing surveys. All of these became tasks which quit with quick deadlines. We took all of this mixed data and plugged it into an evaluation tool, which gave each resource a score and helped to validate our analysis. Using all of this information, we then developed cancellation recommendations and submitted them to the Dean and University Librarian. The end of the fall semester, we evaluated the entire process. This is a very simplified timeline of our tasks, but throughout the spring and summer, we created a plan for our project and collected data for our assessment. The fall semester was dedicated to analyzing all the data we had collected and communicating to stakeholders both inside the library and throughout campus. After our analysis, we prepared our recommendation for the Dean and University Librarian, who was the ultimate decision maker. Once dust had settled, we took some time in early 2020 to evaluate the process. So, our data collection. As I said before, since 2008, collection management had been the responsibility of librarians and staff in CDDS. However, several vacancies in the department created a need to create a cross-departmental team for this project. The e-resources team consisted of three subject librarians, the newly hired e-resources resource librarian who started midway through the project and two department heads, one who played an advisory role and the other worked on external communications. While our team had a diverse range of skills and experiences, none of the team had any recent e-resource experience. Because of this, one of our first tasks was to learn about best practices for resource cancellation projects. One librarian scoured journal articles and websites for other library stories, to which I want to thank every library that has made their information freely available. It really was indispensable. Rapid ass assessment encourages and enables both quantitative and qualitative data collection. We collected and collated various data, data points, including counter for compliant results, clicks, and record view, as well as full text article views and downloads. From this, cost per use was calculated. 
This data had to be collected direct from the ven vendors as we discovered gaps in data errors caused by the library's recent transition to Ex Libris's OMA. In addition to usage data, we used our in institution's faculty reporting system and Web of Science to identify the journals that faculty published in and cited most. We reviewed course embedded LibProxy links in the university's course management system for the past three years to determine what products, ebooks, digitized media, or articles were being used in classes. We also compared our holdings to peer institutions and monitored discussions of cancellation decisions on SPARP and individual library websites. While usage statistics weighed heavily into our analysis, numbers alone do not help to create a collection that supports the overall curriculum, nor would it give us a holistic picture of how our resources were used. The qualitative data was collected from meetings with departments, individual exchanges and surveys with faculty and librarians, accreditation reports and requirements, and in some cases, program and course descriptions. We created a survey about the library's e-resources and asked subject librarians for their knowledge of, of, those, of these specific resources. We needed subject librarians input in order to help us learn about how a particular resource was used for research or to support the curriculum. We also hope to collect information on the history of acquiring the resource. Faculty were also key stakeholders and we slot their input in three main ways. First, we identified key individuals who represented their departments, both those that the library has had a relationship with and those in formal positions, for example, department chairs or members of the university library committee. The committee member in charge of communications went to the majority of department meetings to present about the library's acquisitions budget and our need to align acquisition spending with the library's ac actual budget. The meeting also served as a way to inform faculty about the upcoming survey and a pleas to respond to it. So the most efficient way to collect faculty feedback on specific resources was through a survey. We worked with a trained sociologist with expertise in survey design to develop and structure a survey in a way that allowed for rapid analysis. The survey consisted of eight questions, including several opportunities for comments. The survey started with two general questions, including their primary department and their teaching and research workloads. For each e-resource, we asked about the level of importance for teaching and research from essential resource to not used at all. A related question asked about frequency of use for each resource. Open-ended questions were also asked, including their top five journals. All questions included an opportunity for comments. The survey was distributed through the faculty listserv at the end of September and participants had a two week window to complete it. We received 691 unique responses for a response rate of 59%. All 46 departments were represented in the feedback, although with varying levels of participation. In all, over 4,200 data points were collected including frequency of use and level of importance for teaching and for research. Faculty survey responses yielded a list of 1,672 journal titles deemed essential for their teaching or for their research. Unsurprisingly, a few journals were mentioned repeatedly, such as Nature, Science, Ecology, and JAMA. Our document delivery service, which is more commonly known as Interlibrary Loan, was frequently membered, mentioned as an invaluable resource. What came as a surprise to us, though probably shouldn't have, is that many of our faculty knew little about the cost of e-resources. Once they were shown annual cost and cost per use, they expressed sympathy and outrage. We also discovered that some of our faculty did not distinguish between names of journals, journal packages, and databases. When asked for a list of their top journals, several responses included JSTOR and Google Scholar. We don't know if this was from confusion or if they were emphasizing products they preferred. Interesting themes emerged. The more than 300 unique open-ended responses described support for independent publishers, su supporting open access, and purchasing or retaining diverse publications were echoed throughout departments. Another strong theme from the department meeting was concern over the time it takes to request and obtain articles if access to those articles from the library's website ceased. The anticipation of the possibility of having to wait longer for the PDF was a source of concern. We also learned that our own subject specialists were not always aware of the resources that were purchased for their, their areas. This may be due in part from the shift of collection management responsibilities away from subject librarians. We used a scoring matrix 
for collection evaluation as it would allow for the inclusion of many data points. The scoring matrix was based largely on an electronic resource renewal scorecard developed and used by librarians at the University of Vermont's Howe Library. Quantitative data, such as usage statistics and faculty publications and citation data, made up 40% of the score. Two areas of qualitative data were combined for a total of 60%, of which 30% included faculty input. The other 30% included feedback from subject specialists, from the librarian survey, information from program accreditation requirements, peer comparison overlap analysis, alternative product comparisons, and performance with our library management system. The e-resources group thought that a 20% reduction of our e-resources would significantly affect faculty and students' information needs. However, we were somewhat surprised to discover that many of our resources were in fact unneeded. The result of this activity enabled the team to quickly to learn quickly and make informed consensual decisions. As it were, informed judgment is a critical component of rapid assessment and one that was that we relied on as we were making recommendations to the Dean and University Librarian who was the final decision maker on what resources were ultimately canceled. The culmination of multiple independent yet interrelated data was the crux of our ability to make these informed recommendations. Because of our thorough analysis, we felt very secure in our recommendations. Throughout this process, the e-resources group learned a lot about faculty needs and academic programs on campus. Having this process in place helped to keep our own preferences for specific resources in check, which was an initial concern since three members were subject librarians. Ultimately, using a rapid assessment procedure helped the group achieve the budget goal to reduce acquisition spending with very limited faculty backlash. Our experience supports using a rapid assessment procedure as a project management approach and a tool to evaluate e-resources to make cancellation recommendations. The ability to quickly collect and analyze information from various data points is invaluable to libra libraries with little time to make critical decisions. So if anybody has any questions, here is mine and my colleague's email address. Um, and also my colleague, Amy Hughes, also from the Teaching, Learning and Research Services Department, it will be joining me for the Q&A. Thank you, Teresa. Do you have a couple of questions in the Q&A already? Um, first, what tools did you use to collate all of the different kinds of data that you collected? Um, mostly Excel and Qualtrics. Thank you. And then what was the total amount that was cut when you were finished? And, and what was the original goal? Um, we made our, our goal of $500,000 plus extra. I think our total was 672. Amy's nodding, so I'm good to go with that. Was <laughs> yeah, six hundred about six hundred seventy-two thousand dollars total for that, and then Corona hit um, for additional. So, what has the response to this project been, and both the use of the method and and how much you were able to achieve um, within your library? Do you want to take that, Amy? Oh, go ahead, Teresa. No, I was going to say you take that one. Um, I think it's been incredible and uh, we had very little backlash from faculty and I think they appreciated knowing our methods. Uh, everything changed uh, soon after we completed the project because of the pandemic um, and we were no longer able to apply the method. So there was a, a brief amount of time when we were really enjoying the success of the project, um, but it was, I think, uh, most of our work because it was um, so thorough and well documented uh, was unnoticed by faculty and very much appreciated by internally by the library employees. Thank you. Um, I have a question from the Q&A. Did the rapid assessment model recommend any cancellations that proved controversial? What did you learn from this? Um, and any discussion of tweaking the model based on the results? Yeah, the did. most controversial one is was the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, it's it was very borderline, um, but with the severity of our our need, that was that was I think the most controversial. Sorry, I interrupted you, Amy. Um, sorry to interrupt. Uh, came after the pandemic, so because of the triangulation of data, 
um, the even though in the survey it wasn't uh, strongly represented um, that we had conflicting evidence so we kept it initially um, which was um, helpful because to know that it was so important and then um, after the pandemic we had an additional budget cancellation project in which we did not use the rapid assessment um, because we didn't have an opportunity to use that tool. We just needed to meet the budget. And, um, and when that was canceled, we heard the feedback. So it very much validated our process. Thank you. Um, and is there anything that you would change for the model if, you, if you're able to use it again? I would say one thing for, um, as far as our survey design went, um, for our faculty survey, we gave them a curated list of resources. Um, with uh, three to five, I don't remember, spaces for that they could write in, um, I might just have given them the whole list. Um, as it turned out, some of the resources that we curated for a department were used more, more heavily by other departments that they weren't on the list. And Thank my, you. My response to that would be um, none of the uh, project members were given release time to work on this project. It was just wrapped into our day to day work. Um, and so I would definitely recommend that if you're going to take this on this approach that you're given the time and space to do it. Sure, that makes sense. Uh, that will need to be our final question for this presentation. Um, one person did ask um, about the availability of the presentation and slides because they indicated they were having some technical difficulties um, with this session. I know my my audio has been living a little bit here and it's hard to tell if that's me or you know weather or any of that. Uh, so I just wanted to remind everyone that the PowerPoint slide session recordings and the final edited conference papers will be made available on the conference website. Um, and that the session is being recorded and will be posted to the website later as well. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Teresa and Amy. Thank you. And then we'll move on to our next presentation. Um, our next speaker will be, um, our next presentation will be Modeling Complex DDA Purchasing and Use Patterns with Machine Learning, presented by Kevin Walker, Head of Assessment and Government Information at the University of Alabama. Hello, let's see here if I can get this up and running. All right, that looks okay. I'll go ahead and start. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for uh, showing up today. Um, so I think most of you are probably uh, familiar with demand-driven acquisitions or, or DDA, but just in case, I wanted to hit the main points really quickly. Um, DDA is a, a purchasing model aimed at uh, rectifying the biggest dirty little secret in libraries, which uh, is, of course, unused collections and uh, research across you know several different institutions has shown that even at top research libraries around 80 percent of circulation is generated by uh, as little as 20 percent of the collections um, further a great many of our titles circulate one or fewer times over multi-decade periods and importantly it's it's not the quality of these questions uh, of, of these collections that's in question uh, this is merely a problem with um, a, a related to an inability to accurately predict future research need. And while DDA doesn't really help us in predicting the future, it does provide a, a get out of jail free card in the form of um, not paying for content that remains unused. The pros include wider access to content without an upfront monetary commitment. And as you can see here, 17% of the full text usage of our DDA titles here at uh, the University of Alabama uh, comes from titles that are not even triggered for purchase, meaning that our users are able to access a wide variety of content and assess uh, these resources without committing us to a full purchase. Um, and, you know, library research as well as our own assessment here at UA has shown that DDA titles uh, see much higher levels of use than traditional library and mediated ebook and print monograph purchases. Um, and importantly, uh, higher use means lower cost per use. And uh, the subsequently lower cost per use or CPU figures for DDA titles can help offset uh, higher cost per use collections 
uh, returning a more favorable aggregate level uh, return on investment, which is always important. Um, so let's see here. Uh, there are some cons worth mentioning, uh, including that uh, this purchasing happens within a black box of sorts, which is something that I'll, I'll use that term a few times in today's uh, presentation. And th this can lead to ballooning costs if one is not vigilant in their oversight of the program. Uh, once again, um, we're talking about a complex set of variables in play with, with demand-driven acquisitions. You know, tens of thousands of titles with rotation in and out of the DDA pool, a variety of users interacting with those titles by way of any number of discovery systems uh, that, use, that utilize varying and unknown uh, search and display algorithms. Uh, on top of that, uh, use is driven by need, as we all know, and need in the academic environment is driven by uh, course assignments and the research foci of, of faculty, which all will change or evolve uh, over time. But fortunately, uh, this type of complexity is where uh, machine learning has proven itself highly valuable. Um, simply put, machine learning involves using computers to uh, understand and predict patterns in data. And this is made possible by learning algorithms, uh, which is nothing more than a series of steps used to uh, solve some type of learning problem. On the most basic level, machine learning is split into three types that you see here. Uh, supervised learning is the type used in the project that I'm discussing today and involves actively teaching an algorithm by providing it with examples of learning problems with their respective solutions. So we're showing it the, the test as well as the answer key. And uh, hopefully when we do that, it can know how to solve the problem in some unsolved uh, data that we give it later. Uh, you then have unsupervised learning, which utilizes cluster or pr principal components analysis to separate and group data in ways that uh, draw on their similarities or distinctions. And finally, reinforcement learning involves exposing an algorithm to some type of environment and allowing that algorithm to make adjustments to its output uh, in response to some kind of reward-based stimuli. And here you might think of um, how we train self-driving cars, for example, get from point A to point B without hitting something, get a digital cookie. Um, to be clear though, there are uh, you know, subsets of these learning models, but they're not really relevant. So I, I wasn't gonna get into that today. So turning to the project that my colleague Jahan and I uh, carried out, um, I wanted to first talk about the data, which included um, you know, metadata from 24 months of, of DDA activity. And uh, here we're talking about over 52,000 titles uh, that are in the DDA pool, 306 publishers represented there, 57 unique publication years, almost 9,800 titles that were triggered for purchase. And on average, each of these titles would have been available to our users uh, about 532 days or a little under a year and a half. Uh, the variables that we're looking at are publisher, publication year, LC class, price, and trigger status with trigger status acting as our dependent variable. Secondly, uh, the tools we used uh, include the data I just mentioned, uh, which are randomly partitioned into training and test data sets with the um, training data comprised of a random 80% sampling of the data and uh, the test data comprised of a random 20% sample. And we work with these data within the RStudio development environment. Uh, in this case, we actually used our studio server, and this provided us with a good bit more uh, processing power with eight dedicated uh, processing cores and uh, 32 gigs of RAM. And you know, this is probably overkill in most situations for what we were doing, but having that extra computing power was really helpful in that we could run a lot of these analyses much more quickly. And that gave us some time to kind of play around rather than have to sit and uh, just watch the uh, the computers, you know, process through these things. Um, the software we used were uh, two main R packages, the general linear model package or GLM package, as well as uh, a package called Adabag. And um, we also would have used a, a host of peripheral packages that were required as dependencies of, of these main two. 
In order to frame our work within the established literature, we pitted our machine learning model against a more traditional uh, log logistic regression approach. And uh, for those who may be unfamiliar with uh, this method, it's, a, it's akin to linear regression in that we are predicting the outcome of some dependent variable based on one or more independent variables. However, uh, unlike linear regression, which features a continuous dependent variable, um, logistic regression focuses on predicting a categorical, like binary dependent variable. Uh, in, in this case, we're predicting, for example, that the either titles will be triggered or not triggered for purchase. On the other side, we have our machine learning approach, um, which was made possible via that had a bag R package. Uh, and this package allows us to combine adaptive boosting or add a boost with a combination of bootstrapping and aggregation, uh, what's called bagging. And uh, when we combine multiple methods like this, we call it an ensemble method. And these types of methods are especially powerful and widely used in machine learning. And to be sure, there are, of course, nuances to navigate and complex math that kind of underlie these methods. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to get into that discussion. So. Uh, what I can say, though, about, uh, you know, using the Adabag package, first, uh, the Adaboost M1 algorithm uh, is using multiple iterations of a, de of a decision tree classification of data. And those who may not be familiar with that, uh, decision trees, uh, it, you know, here's a basic example. And, and they're really nothing more than a simple modeling of decision parameters for a particular situation. Uh, in this case, it had to do with, um, you know, applications for credit, for example. Uh, now, unlike our regression model, which involves running only a single test to determine what's going on with our variables, uh, our machine learning model will run many tests. And uh, as each round of tests progresses, uh, increased focus, in this case, is placed on what we call weak learners, uh, which are classifiers or decision trees in which the error term, and that is the difference between the prediction and the actual outcome, is little better than 0 0.5. And that is, of course, a 50-50 shot or a coin flips chance. Um, and, and as this process of tweaking our um, classification model throughout the learning process, uh, as we do this throughout the learning process uh, in response to error, that, that is the adaptive part of adaptive boosting. And in this case, we, we diverge a little bit from the standard Adaboost approach in that we use um, Leo Bremen's bagging method, uh, which utilizes a specific type of decision tree model known as random forest as our base classifier. Uh, and here we're taking advantage of randomized sampling with replacement and a similar weak learner focused approach. And this provides an advantage in that it helps to avoid overfitting in the model. And uh, to be clear, overfitting occurs when our classifier is so well suited to predicting outcomes within our training data that it performs quite poorly uh, with our testing data or out in the real world. Uh, the model is overfitted to the specifics uh, of its training sample. And for the results, uh, in the case of our logistic regression model, uh, predictive capacity was limited to just 10.4%, which is quite poor. Um, but nevertheless, it is in line with the one other study we found using this method to predict patterns in DDA. Uh, at the same time, though, our Adaboost model showed predictive capacity above 82%. Um, with regard to how our Adaboost model uh, makes its predictions, um, publisher is the most heavily weighted variable in play, uh, as shown in this graphic here on the right. Um, while um, you know, publication year, LC class, and costs are all weighted much lower. Uh, one should understand, though, that these lower weighted variables are responsible for settling ties within the decision tree structures. So um, they are actually more important than their weighting might suggest uh, in this particular graphic. Um, and to illustrate that, let's consider this table here on the left, which um, shows uh, several of our um, results. And uh, as you can see, the first two listings in this table are titles coming from the same publisher. Uh, nevertheless, the, the difference in the pub year, LC class, and price all help to produce a wildly different uh, p-value for each title. 
as you can see, the uh, first title has only a 16% chance of being triggered for purchase, while the second title has a 94% chance. So what does this all mean? Um, first, a few key takeaways include that Adabag provides a simple means of deploying the Adaboost algorithm right out of the box. There are no complex settings to navigate as with more advanced boosting algorithms and the results often prove just as accurate as those more advanced algorithms. Uh, further, this Adaboost method is capable of producing an actionable predictive model within the context of DDA. And when we say actionable, we mean a model with predictive capacity above 70%. Uh, importantly, the Adabag package can also be deployed to solve multi-class uh, problems as well. And as you can imagine, these are um, pretty widespread within uh, the library environment. And uh, uh, here are a few key questions kind of present themselves. Um, first, can machine learning be effectively deployed within the library environment? And hopefully, as this proof of concept shows, it is theoretically possible. However, um, the, the practicality of the matter is, like most things, dependent on resources. Uh, in particular, libraries need data scientists and developers on hand to uh, deploy these types of solutions in meaningful ways. Uh, but luckily, we're seeing this more and more in libraries. They're employing personnel with these types of skills. So that's a good thing. And this brings us to the more important question of, is this assessment? Uh, and, and to be clear, machine learning is not meant to provide understanding in the way traditional statistical modeling and assessment do. Uh, this is a point broached often within the uh, data science literature. Uh, many, in fact, point out that we cannot understand phenomena through machine learning. We can only benefit from its highly accurate predictions. However, the jury is still out on that assumption uh, because there are actually several ways learning algorithms can be unpacked to better understand the processes in play, which will be more important as we start using these algorithms for more sensitive decisions in particular. In terms of potential uses, the, the most obvious involve deploying these algorithms toward greater customization of library experiences for our users and uh, predicting usage patterns, for example, we can make value additive content and uh, service recommendations. And of course, we can potentially save money for purchasing only those materials that we'll likely to see use. Uh, and considering that using data to improve our collections or services is often a focus of library assessment, then perhaps machine learning, uh, when leveraged in this way, uh, can also be considered assessment. And uh, of course, to take full advantage of this technology, we need to expand our access to user data. And this is where uh, additional uh, important questions arise surrounding uh, how such customization changes uh, our roles as information providers. Um, but, uh, you know, in particular, we need to be careful about search bubbles and, and uh, privacy uh, matters related to our users' data. Um, but uh, for that, I, I know I'm running a little bit long, so I'm just going to end it there for now. But if anybody has any questions, ask away now or uh, feel free to email me. Thank you, Kevin. We'll turn it over for questions right now. And a reminder to put your questions in the Q&A box so that we can make sure to pass them on. Can you talk a bit more about what you mean by the search Bubble? Yeah, I'm sorry. I had to cut that off. I was going slower than I thought. Um, yeah, so search bubble is a, a, an issue that arises when we use these type of algorithms. Um, it's like an echo chamber effect where, uh, and you'll see this a lot in Facebook or other uh, venues that you probably get recommendations from, you know, they'll start hammering you with the same type of content over and over again to the point where you're not seeing any new information. So. Uh, there are uh, ways of getting around this that data scientists are looking at. In particular, they inject um, sort of uh, randomized novel information algorithms into these situations. So every once in a while you get something pushed into your feed that wasn't really related to anything you've normally looked at, but uh, can provide for like serendipitous uh, discovery of new information. Thank you. 
uh, got the questioner that says thank you for the additional explanation. I think we have time for one more question before we go to our next break. In case there's not one, one thing I will say is I know this stuff can seem very complicated and, and it is in some ways, but um, you know, I was a neophyte in these waters not too long ago and, and uh, this, the, the packages that we used in particular in this case are pretty easy to navigate. Looks like we do have one final question. Um, how do you plan to implement the findings of this study at your library? You know, that's, that's a great question because we have not, uh, we've done other assessments that we kind of rely on for uh, tweaking our DDA program. And um, this was more of a, of a, an experiment to see, you know, how can we deploy this? Uh, I, I think it would be nice to utilize the boosting algorithm a little bit more. Um, I, I'd like to see it used more in customization of, of experiences for library users, but uh, we don't have access to as much data as you might need for that. And it's kind of a sensitive issue. So at some point, I hope we are able to deploy something like Open Athens all across our university, which would provide sort of a way of connecting um, sensitive data together and providing only the de-identified data to places like the library. And I think that would be a safe way of, of deploying that. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Um, we're now going to head into our second 15 minute break. We'll once again have music playing as an auditory cue if you step away from your computer. Um, and we will be back at 35 minutes past the hour.
Welcome back. Um, our next presentation will be Experiences and Expectations of a Library Document Delivery Service, presented by Craig Smith and Emily Campbell. Craig is the Assessment Specialist and Senior Associate Librarian at the University of Michigan. Emily is the Director of Document Delivery and Senior Associate Librarian also at the University of Michigan. A third author on this project is Larissa Stenzel, formerly a Research and Assessment Associate at the University of Michigan. Over to you, Craig and Emily. Hi, everyone. So this is Emily, and I'm going to get us started here. Um, so uh, first of all, I'm just going to give you a little background on what we do at the University of Michigan is a uh, here located here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and we're a large research university. Um, my department provides interlibrary loan for all three of the University of Michigan campuses, which includes Flint and Dearborn. Um, we also do document delivery, our scan and deliver service. Um, we manage our health sciences offsite facility, which is here in town, um, and we provide during normal times when we're not in the pandemic, we have office delivery of ILO material and our local collection. Um, so we, we haul material all over campus. We have a lot of students who do that. We uh, also provide uh, material through MELCAT, which is our statewide uh, lending consortia. We just lend, we do not borrow through them. And then we participate in Rapid, Backline, and UBORROW, which is the BTAA uh, consortial. Uh, lending and borrowing service. Um, we're a very busy office. We have um, last, you know, we're usually in the top borrowers and lenders in OCLC, and I have about 21 staff right now. And usually we have about 20 to 30 students at any time, but right now we don't have any. So I just wanted to give you a quick uh, overview of what we do and how we're structured before Craig got into our survey and what we asked and how everything was going. But um, I'm going to hand this over to Craig now. Okay, thanks. Um, and there's just a little bit more, Emily. I didn't know if you wanted to do this slide or you want me to jump into it. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, Craig. I can I can do this. So uh, so our <laughs> sorry sorry, Craig. Uh, changes on the horizon. So um, so what we were doing is when we when we started thinking about this, and this is kind of hard to think about in a minute for a minute because um, we were you know we had we did this survey before the pandemic. So so at the time we had more immediate plans to move more physical materials offsite. We still will do that eventually, but we hadn't quite gotten there. Um, you know our plans for a repository are on hold. Um, but what is still moving forward is our, our preparation to move to a true collective collection in the BTAA with that work. Um, I'm on the BTAA Big Collection Steering Committee and very involved in that. And um, we, you know, the interdependence of that work is very important to all of us here at Michigan. And so, so thinking about that and how we, we frame, you know, uh, material that is available to you, but not owned by us and, and those kinds of issues. Um, the other thing is we are currently in the midst of moving to Alma. So so we from Aleph and we will do that in July. So there's a that's a lot of change. I mean, we still will be on for my department, we'll still be using Iliad, but the Alma change will be significant for other reasons. Um, and we just wanted to, it, at the time, it was a great time for us to learn more about our document delivery services, who was using them, um, you know, what's working well for our campus, what isn't working well, how we can do things better, and, you know, what people think about these changes. You know, we've moved material, of course, as, as any large library has offsite over the years for the past 30 or 40 years, and there's been, uh, you know, various responses by certain groups, and we wanted to kind of try and get ahead of that and be able to communicate proactively. So I think those were the main reasons we were we were looking to do this. And of course, this is actually, you know, even though things have changed with the pandemic, this is still really relevant. So we're, we're really excited about these results. Thanks, Craig. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, so um, the study design, um, I want to just go over that real briefly. We included um, uh, the population of FY19 document delivery users, we have records of everyone who used some aspect of the service, whether it be delivery of physical items or scanning um, and emailing of items. Um, and um, they were all invited to participate. Um, and we also, from them, collect survey data. We have document delivery data on uh, their number of times they've used different aspects of the services. So these are all being pulled into the same data set. Um, and then we combine that with some HR data. Um, so Knowing who those folks were, we then were able to pull information about their roles on campus. Um, so we focused in this study on graduate students and faculty members, but faculty members come across all tracks, research track, clinical track, tenure track, lectures. 
um, excuse me, across all ranks as well. Um, grad students, of course, uh, are in master's programs, doctoral programs, um, and of course, we have disciplinary areas as well that we're very interested in. So understanding all of that about our, our sample was important to us. Um, and then we also pulled in a group of folks that hadn't used the service recently or at all. Um, so these are people that were not in the document delivery records with between FY14 and 19. Um, and um, we pulled a matching group of those folks into our um, study as well using propensity score matching. So that basically um, uses the characteristics of those folks in the 2019 um, document delivery user group, um, things like their area of study, their role on campus, um, demographic information, how long they've been on campus, et cetera, in a logistic regression model to sort of predict um, in some ways, like uh, it generates what are called propensity scores, which are probabilities, estimated probabilities, um, that a person might have um, um, sort of been exposed to or experienced something, um, in this case, the use of document delivery. So it allowed us to pull in a very comparable group of not um, non-users or non-recent users. And these are really important for us to understand as well, in part because we want to understand what might be motivating some people to use the service and what might um, be um, behind other people not using it, um, other very similar folks on campus not using it. Um, so the participants in the FY19 document delivery user group, um, we had ultimately about almost 1,400 of them in our sample, so it's about a 25% response rate to the survey, and really evenly split across grad students and faculty members, and really a nice even split across tracks and ranks for faculty members, um, and um, or I shouldn't say even split, but a nice representation. And then also nice representation across broad disciplinary areas as well. And in our um, comparison sample, folks that we're interested in who haven't used the service recently or at all, um, we have fewer of them, not surprisingly. They're probably less invested in getting back to us, but we still had a nice chunky sample of almost 500 of them. Um, and then a bit more skew towards grad students and you see a bit more of a skew um, towards uh, STEM fields here, but still a nice spread across all those um, roles on campus. And I'll jump right into what we found, so I don't um, go too far over time here, which I'm worried about. Um, so first we asked them to just report on uh, their use of document delivery. Even though we have some information about that, we wanna make sure um, that they're sort of framing their use in terms of what they remember. Um, so in terms of physical items delivered, um, we do see that the FY19 users um, report doing this more often than the non-users. The non-users might have done that outside of the window between FY14 and 19. So there's some of those in there. And then some of the um, FY19 users did not use document delivery for physical items, um, but you can see um, probably those are folks that uh, either double dipped and used both physical and the scanning emailing of documents or only used uh, the service for scanning and emailing. So again, we see that where more people here in our FY19 user groups are indicating that they've used the scanning emailing services and most of the non users between that window of 14 and 19 um, indicated they didn't use scanning. Um, so nice, again, comparison sample with our uh, user group, our recent user group. Um, so we did also look a little bit at the data we have on these folks in the FY9 user group. I won't dwell on this too long, but um, what, you see, what you see here in this histogram is that most of the folks who use the service um, for physical deliveries in this um, uh, 67 percent of them fell between one and ten deliveries so that's sort of where most of the, the action is for uh, uh, physical item delivery and there are some super users as you can see way out there on the end of the distribution and this is for scans and again you can see that most folks fell between one and ten scans requested if there are um, recent users 84 percent of folks in our survey fell between there again we have some super users and when you pit um, in a uh, scatter plot the uh, use of scans and document um, physical deliveries, you can see that we have one wildly uh, amazing super user uh, within one fiscal year, hundreds and hundreds of requests on both parts of the service. So just have to give that person a little shout out. Um, so we also are interested in the use of the service by role. So you can see on the bottom of this bar chart, there's faculty um, members and there's grad students. And then we're looking at mean numbers of deliveries and mean numbers of scans here. And you can see that in general, when people are using the service, they're more often requesting th things being delivered than scanned. But really, um, in this, in this um, analysis, we see very similar patterns of use across both faculty members and grad students. So that's helpful and informative to know that um, folks in these different roles across campus are using the service in similar ways. Um, we also looked at it by faculty track. Again, down at the bottom, you can see deliveries are on the left and scans are on the right, two aspects of the service. And we're looking at tenure track faculty here, lectures, clinical track faculty, and research track. Um, and 
um, one of the things we notice here is um, not surprisingly, folks in um, teaching roles tend to be using the service a bit more. Um, and so that, that includes tenure track faculty, um, who are of course very heavily involved in research as well, and then lecturers. Um, we see a bit of a drop off with clinical track and research track folks, but they are indeed users of the service. Um, so those are all things that are important for us to note. Um, and so somewhat similar patterns across the two types of um, services. Um, sorry, I'm having a little trouble here. Okay. Um, and then um, we also looked at it by field type, and this is not surprising, especially in line with some other things we've heard even in some of the talks today, where folks in the arts and humanities fields are using both the delivery, which is on the left, and emailing and scanning um, service um, a bit more, um, in some cases a lot more heavily than folks in other fields, uh, especially social sciences and STEM, where the fields we looked at here. And these are broad disciplinary areas here. Um, but you know, later on, we'll, we'll see a little hint here about why we might want to pay more attention to these arts and humanities folks. Um, so we asked a lot about turnaround time. Um, what timing would you typically want for scanning, uh, emailing of a document, delivery of a document uh, that's physical? What would be too long? And then what do you remember experiencing? Um, and we also looked at that in terms of how um, non-users or non-recent users thought about this. We wondered if people who hadn't used the service had sort of unrealistic expectations of what might be uh, part of this service. Um, we gave them re this, the response scale you see here on the right. Um, and one thing we saw, uh, this is physical delivery here first, that the FY19 users um, uh, compared to the comparison group um, for their desired turnaround time are very similar. So it's not like not using the service gives you an, a wildly unrealistic expectation of what should be desirable. Um, so around two days for physical delivery and what would be too long is getting close to a week for both of these groups. Um, and for scanning and emailing, there's a bit of a um, expectation that things would be faster. But again, here you would see that the um, comparison group is very similar in their expectations to the um, uh, frequent user group. Um, Emily, were you gonna say something? No, maybe not. Okay. Um, and then we are looking here at um, uh, sort of the um, faculty grad student difference here now. And again, what you see here across the board is what's desired, what's experienced and what's too long um, is very similar for grad students and faculty members. So it's not like one group is more demanding or um, has higher expectations than the other. The other thing I'll point out here is that across the board, um, what people experience in terms of turnaround time is pretty close to the desired turnaround time, which is really nice for us to know. But it also shows that we do have a bit, a bit of work to do if we want to get all the way to that desired turnaround time, but it's not a huge gap. The larger gap is between what, what people experience and what feels too long to them, which is nice to know. Um, and then this is the same kind of picture we see with scanning turnaround times. Again, desired is a little bit lower than desire for um, physical delivery. People understand that it might be easier to get something to you and email faster, but we're doing pretty well compared to what um, they've experienced. And clearly we're not getting uh, too close to what feels too long to people, which is really nice. Um, and, then, and we see the same kind of picture emerging when we look at it by field where there isn't one broad disciplinary area that seems more demanding or more has higher expectations of us than another. Um, so I'll skip over this because it's pretty much the same information. Um, so the main thing I want to focus on before I turn it back to Emily is, is um, this really important group of people that haven't used it recently or at all. Um, so why this lack of use of the service among many in the comparison sample? And um, we see that the really big reason is that most of these folks uh, um, are unaware uh, that the service existed. So this provides us with a really great direction to be more um, uh, active in marketing the service. A lot of folks also get their needed documents online. Um, some people like getting stuff themselves or don't have library needs, and some people really like just heading to the stacks. Um, and of course, that's not really possible now. <laughs> um, are certain groups more likely um, to be unaware of our services? Not um, uh, uh, That is true of, of faculty versus grad students, where students are a bit more likely, significantly more likely, to be unaware of the services. So that also points in a direction we can use for marketing. Um, but there's not a significant difference across disciplinary areas. Um, and then are certain groups in the comparison sample more likely to get what they need online? Um, and again, that's not, not true in terms of the faculty student split, but it is very true in terms of disciplinary areas where folks in STEM fields are more, much more likely than folks, for example, in arts and humanities fields to find what they need online. Um, so again, this points to some of the work we need to do to get information about the services to certain fields more than others, particularly uh, the arts and humanities. Um, I will try to buzz through this because I'm running low on time, I think. But um, one thing we know is that we're planning to put more materials in a local repository with quick delivery um, attached to that. And most folks are pretty okay with this. Um, it's true across faculty and students, across disciplinary areas. Um, but there is about 10% that aren't and we need to 
uh, figure out um, how to address some of their concerns. And we have some of those listed in the, um, the, quali the qualitative portion of our data. Um, and then also this collective collections idea, how many people are okay with it or at least neutral about it. And again, we see a similar uh, pattern emerging here with faculty and students. Most are okay with it, about 10% aren't. Um, and we do see differences here where um, STEM folks are much more okay with this than arts and humanities folks, although the majority, the vast majority of all disciplinary areas seem okay with this. So points to a little more work we might wanna do with the folks in arts and humanities fields around this collective collection scenario. And I'm gonna um, stop there for now and just share a few things that people told us about what we could do uh, to make the service uh, a strong service. And a lot of this stuff is already stuff we wanna do, uh, which is make it speedy, accurate, dependable, um, engage in good communication about requests that have been made, make sure our scans are readable, um, provide an easy process for making requests and deliver to convenient locations. So these are things people really want out of a good service like ours. Um, and then things that people said we could be doing better. Um, so make the process for making requests even easier, figuring out some of the issues that are in, um, breaking down with certain links in our search records to lead people to make requests, um, doing things like putting more drop boxes around campus so returning items is easier, um, improving scanning, um, and making it clear how to use the service. Um, and I'm going to turn it back to Emily now. Um, I know I'm buzzing through this pretty quickly, but I wanna make sure she has time to do the last part of her slides. So really quick, I'm just going to do this. Uh, so on hold, where we are now is our media plans for the repository, like I said, are on hold due to spending freezes. But moving forward, we're working on an um, accessibility remediation project for our digital documents to ensure everything's not just OCR. It's quality OCR, for especially for people who need it. Um, <clears throat> The goal would be to have more material return boxes around campus, but at this point we're really, you know, that's slightly on hold, but we're thinking about really how to just move material better around campus. We're working on ways to make scanning process faster and we have really, um, that's been, this year has been, we've got a pretty close to a 24 hour turn of time around, turnaround time around. But you know what I'm saying. And uh, so, and the collective collection, we're still, you know, working on redefining what ownership means with departments on campus. And that's an exciting piece of this. Um, it doesn't have to be on our shelves for access. Um, but anyways, I know we're almost out of time, but uh, we did, the most importantly, I really felt like we, we, we felt, we got a good sense of what faculty and grad students are positive about the plan changes to onsite collection and our current services, which, you know, which as you saw, we have some super users. So thanks. Sorry, Elizabeth, I didn't mean to go over. <laughs> No worries. So we have um, a question in the Q and A. Um, what strategies did you use to attract more participation, if any? Craig, uh, we didn't. We just sent out the email. Right? Craig did that. So, but you're muted. Do you, do you mean more participation in document delivery service or in the in the survey? In the survey, I was. Assuming. I assume in the survey. That was that yeah. was the question as submitted. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah, we um we did send out unique links in Qualtrics, so um we. We, we were able to send reminders to folks who hadn't responded yet, which always boosts participation. Um, we sent a few reminders and also we had some incentives as well. So we had a drawing for some prizes as well. So that did help as well. And I was surprised at how many faculty wanted to enter into the prize thing. They're, they're into the prizes too. So it's kind of good to know. Um, is this service available for undergraduates as well or only faculty and graduate students? It is, all these services are available for undergrads. They're just not very heavy users. Um, so we recently changed our scanning service. It, you, we used to charge undergrads, and so we would they just would hit that seven dollar wall and never come back. We've changed that, and it hasn't. We it's it, we have more undergrads using it, but not nearly the level of grad students and, and the faculty. Thank you. And there was a question in the chat. Um, someone was wondering if you specifically asked about the use of SciHub. Um, and no, we did not. Did not. Okay. <laughs> we did not specifically, but we are very aware of Sci. Okay. <laughs> so it was like in the back of our minds as we were thinking about it. Um, I, I can't quote the research, but I have heard that in, for some reason, Ann Arbor is not a super Sci Hub user area, but I'm, I, I have no proof of that. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We have time for perhaps one more question before we move on. Emily, I see you have your hand up. Was that me? Sorry, yep. I didn't mean to. <laughs> no worries. Just, you know, raising my hand on accident. Sorry. <laughs> and then the final question is whether there's a fee associated with the service. 
No, we don't charge for any of our services. So we did, like I said, at one point we were charging undergrads, but we do not charge, our, we do not charge our campus for our services, right? Thank you. Um, then we're going to go ahead and move on to our next presentation. Thank you. Um, our next presenter may look a bit familiar. We have Craig Smith, Assessment Specialist and Senior Associate Librarian at the University of Michigan, returning to present Exploring Undergraduate Experiences with Obtaining Course Texts, Including a Novel Look at Adoptable Monographs. Also presenting is Charles Watkinson, Director of the University of Michigan Press and AUL for Publishing. A third author on this study is Danielle Colburn, formerly a marketing assistant at the University of Michigan. So over to you, Craig and Charles. Craig, you are muted. I was just wondering if that's working. <laughs> yeah, can people see that? Yes, we see the slides now. Thank you. All right, go, all right, Charles, then you're ready to jump in, I think. You can unmute and go for it. OK, well, thank you very much for this opportunity um, to talk about uh, a slightly different kind of assessment uh, project. Um, so I am uh, I have this dual uh, role at uh, University of Michigan Library. Um, so I'm head of the publishing division, which we call Michigan Publishing, of which the University of Michigan Press is part. And uh, uh, I'm uh, also uh, uh, the director of University of Michigan Press, so that I and a cat just muted me. Um, uh, and uh, University of Michigan Press is one of about a, um, th uh, a 30 or so, uh, more than 30 university presses uh, that report to libraries. Um, and this is a growing trend. Um, the University of Michigan Press is unusually integrated into the library. So this has been, uh, uh, I'm the only person who holds this dual um, title of uh, Associate University Library. Charles, you're muted again. I get it. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, the, the, some of the opportunities that exist being both a publisher and a library. Um, so Craig, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, adoptable monographs. And just to explain what we mean by that, uh, uh, these are the three types of output of University of Michigan Press as a book publisher. So we publish textbooks, which are designed for courses as the primary uh, reference for a course, a primary teachable resource. Uh, we publish monographs, which are by scholars for scholars. They are the products of research to be used by researchers. And then we publish something which is uh, originally often intended to be a monograph, but then gets picked up as a supplementary text, a secondary text in a course. And we call those adoptable books. And almost all university presses have this category. Uh, that's somewhere between a monograph and a textbook. And it's mostly used in upper level courses. So 300, 400 level courses. Uh, so this is a particular type of book we were looking at. So next slide, please. And the reason we were looking at this uh, type of book is we've seen a very substantial decrease over the years in the sales of monographs. And uh, we've been trying to work out what's going on there. And again, uh, the sales of monographs have been particularly bad for print. Um, Ebooks have been picking up, but the uh, level of compensation we get from ebook versions does not equal the loss, does not offset the loss that we make from print versions. And this is actually a very, very typical picture of university press publishing that you see in this graph. Um, and the uh, black and yellow line uh, in the middle shows the decline in monograph sales over the last uh, 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 15 years. Um, and uh, we're really trying to understand what's going on there. So what is going on there? Is it that uh, library sales are um, you know, switching 
um, uh, uh, to uh, provide multi-user access to eBooks and students are no longer buying the adoptable books because they can get them free through the library? Or are they buying all their copies used on Amazon? Are they pirating, um, uh, sharing free eBook files? Or is it that uh, these, these are not used so much in classes, like professors are not assigning uh, more than one book in a class or they're using um, uh, chapters uh, and posting them on canvas or whatever, but it's all anecdotes. So we've had a lack of data. And so this is uh, a, a project that uh, I and Kathleen Folger, who's the uh, electronic resources officer approached Craig with, um, and we were interested in finding out more about how students used adoptable books on campus. So next slide, please. And Craig, I think over to you. Great, thanks so much, Charles. Um, yeah, so I think uh, just to recap, we're really interested in understanding how students gain access to their course books um, and what kind of strategies they use and what kind of decisions they make, part in part fueled by stressors that might motivate some of them. Um, and also how does that look in particular with regard to adoptable monographs? So I'll share how we did that. Um, so in um, this, we have sort of two arms of this study um, and there's a lot of overlap between the two arms. We have a general textbook sample. So almost 5,000 undergrads um, were invited to participate in a survey about their general um, patterns of behavior when it comes to ac acquiring books for their courses. And we oversampled, uh, in this case, underrepresented racial and ethnic groups on campus in order to make sure that we had enough of those folks in the sample that we could do some analyses to understand their experiences in particular. Um, and we ended up with 534 surveys that yielded usable data. So it was a low response rate, but enough data to allow us, and, and a, a diverse enough sample to allow us to, to meet our goals for the study. We also um, looked at courses that were being offered in, I guess it's what we call winter, uh, sort of in the springtime, uh, um, 2019 courses. And we were able to identify a bunch of courses that had assigned these adoptable monograph type books that Charles talked about. So university press type monographs were um, adopted by professors for their classes as course books. And so students in these classes were invited to participate and answer questions about those books in particular, uh, in some cases, and about, uh, and we had 213 of those folks in the, uh, in the data. And um, the surveys covered things like demographic information, search strategies for when you get assigned a book and how you go about one, acquiring it, um, how you would like it to be acquired and how you end up ultimately acquiring it. Um, things that might fuel your behavior, like so stressors that might impact your decision making around acquiring books and how you mitigate those stresses. And then also, um, we're not going to focus as much on print versus digital today, but what happens with the book after the class? What do you do with it? Um, and there's a lot of very similar questions in the adoptable monograph survey, um, but we, in, in, in some cases, ask them to reflect on their purchasing and, or their acquisition behavior with regard to that specific book. And um, the title of that book was actually piped right into the Qualtrics survey and they were asked to confirm that they were indeed in a class with that book. So we felt very confident about the data we obtained. Um, the participants um, in the general survey, we had um, a nice even spread for the most part across class standing, although uh, leaned a bit more towards freshmen or first year students. And that same kind of pattern emerged for the adoptable monograph survey, uh, although it bit, uh, skewed even a little bit more towards first year students. We did have a nice uh, group representing each of the classes in, this, in the survey. Um, and in terms of uh, demographics, we focus here a bit more on race and ethnicity, just because that's especially important to us in understanding some of the uh, backgrounds of students that might lead them to feel especially stressed about uh, money and acquiring books. Um, and in the underrepresented groups, um, we have folks that are, for example, identifying as Black or African American or Latinx or um, uh, Native American, et cetera. So groups that are traditionally more underrepresented on um, our campus. And we have way more of them in the sample than we do on campus. So we met our goals of oversampling that group in order to be able to run some statistics that help us understand their experiences better. And the same is true, actually, we have overrepresentation of folks that identify in some way as Asian in their heritage. Um, and of course, the largest group is still white, but it is not a, a majority of the entire sample. Um, and then we see a, a bit more of a skew towards um, a, a white group and the sample of uh, the adoptable monograph part of the study, in part because we were really constrained by who we invited uh, to that part of the study. We, we just had to lean on who was in those classes that were using those adoptable mon monographs. So the constraints there led to the, uh, the difference you see here. Um, and also we note that we have about a little over 20% in both of these samples uh, of students identifying as first generation uh, and very few identified as having a reading disability that impacts reading in some way. 
Um, and we're not going to deal with that today uh, because we're not really focusing on electronic versus print right now in this, in this presentation. Um, so what we found, um, first we asked them just, what do you do when you get assigned a book? Like, um, where do you go look for it? Um, and so this is just about the initial search. And a lot of people start by searching on Amazon and Google. Far fewer, if you note, um, start their search in the library. So that's something just the, as, as folks in the library were interested in as well. But one thing I thought was interesting is you see a shift towards more and more people starting their initial search for their book uh, with the library as you get towards uh, the senior year. Uh, so one of the things that might be interesting is to understand whether they become to realize that the library can be a useful resource for them when searching for course books and how do we get more of that information to folks when they start on campus as opposed to when they're farther along in their experience on campus. Now, this is a bit overwhelming, but I'll just hit the highlights here. When asked to how you actually acquired these books, um, you know, the folks in the general survey are talking about multiple books, like how they do things typically. And then other folks in the, uh, on the right of this were asked about this book in particular. So one-to-one -one comparisons here are difficult, but still I'd point out that it's not surprising that a lot of folks are acquiring their course books, um, print new, print used, um, renting books, either print or digital, um, et cetera. Um, so these are really not surprising results. But it is interesting to note where there are not uh, like sort of substantial differences across the two acquisition types. So far fewer um, uh, students are uh, relating that they rented these adoptable monographs, um, that they uh, found them as digital materials on a course site, um, that they got a digital uh, version of them free, or that they rented or bought them as digital. Um, so these are differences that emerged uh, across these two um, types of uh, acquisitions. And, and when you ask just like, how would you most like to get your course books? Most of them want new print books, uh, or not, I shouldn't say most, but the largest percentage of them want new print books. Um, and so it is also interesting to note that although students have certain preferences, far fewer uh, students actually get to enact those preferences. And we'll, we'll, we'll think about why that is later. Um, so the other thing to note is just asking folks, students in the survey who indicated that they bought or rented course books or the adoptable monograph, the other thing you'll see is a notable difference is that far fewer of them were able to just walk into the local store we have on campus and find that adoptable monograph to buy, or at least far fewer did that. Um, so that's another difference across these two groups right now. Um, now, when we think about spending, um, we asked about just in general what you spent uh, in, that, in that particular semester on course books. And the general um, sample and the adoptable monograph sample were asked the same thing. Just how much did you spend across all your books um, as your best guess? And it's right around um, you know, $170 uh, dollars for the general sample for a mean and $150, $60 for the adoptable monograph sample. So not different in a big way here. Um, and there is, is there indeed no significant difference here. And you can see there's a wide range. So some folks are not spending much at all or, or nothing at all. And other folks are spending up to uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars close to a thousand. Um, when asked about the specific adoptable monograph that we um, uh, indicated we were interested in for the adoptable monograph sample. The full sample, folks that indicated buying it, getting it another way, renting it, et cetera, um, you can see that a large number of them didn't pay anything for it. And so this again relates back to some of the stuff Charles is talking about, about trying to understand the drops in income or uh, revenue associated with these types of books. Um, and, um, and there, of course, is a, a, a mean value here, about $12, so not a lot. Um, the maximum is up to $90. And, for folks that indicated that they bought these adoptable monographs new, we were also interested in what they were spending. And the mean does jump a bit if you're buying it new and just look at that one group and they are spending a bit more like $24 or $25 for that, that adoptable monograph buying it new. Um, so I wanna check time here. Uh, I think we're getting low. So I'm going to um, just buzz through uh, a, a few of these and just note um, that students engage in real strategic thinking about how to reduce their costs, including finding free versions online, which is becoming more and more common, buying used, um, uh, renting, et cetera. Um, and some of this, um, um, uh, some of the things that I should say stress students out, I'm gonna skip ahead here, um, and, and lead them to engage in these behaviors are, are um, like financial stresses. So you can see that um, one reason they reduce costs, that second bar here is because they're stressed about affording other things. Um, and some of the things that the costs um, promote, uh, um, provoke them to do is even to not purchase a required book for a course. So you can see here that these are real uh, decision points for students. Um, and due to book costs, first generation students are actually more likely than others to not have taken a class or to have felt additional stress about affording uh, essential resources. 
And I'm going to turn it back over to Charles here to reflect on some of the stuff that we're thinking about next. So this is really helpful. It was a small sample, but it really suggested some of the path, uh, the, the, the patterns. Uh, and uh, it suggested useful, actionable items for the university press to work on and for the library to work on. So the university press, uh, this really informed uh, this question that is really facing us at the moment. Do we lock down our books or do we open them up? Uh, this really suggested to us that, uh, you know, uh, print uh, purchasing uh, was really still very, very important. Uh, locking down our ebooks was not really a good strategy. So we should pursue more ways of opening up our books, especially because uh, even fairly low prices stress students. Um, we also wanted to uh, make sure that uh, we continue to uh, look at the use of these books um, and uh, look not uh, at the success just through revenue, but also through use. And just that print is really important for learning. We saw uh, this really re a strong reliance on print, a desire to buy new books in print for these course books. So we need to make sure that print is easily available and through Amazon, instantly available, because Amazon is a place that students turn, particularly when they want a book fast. So next slide, please. From a library point of view, um, it was uh, disappointing to see how few students initially went to the library to look for these books. And remember, these are course books. So these are the sorts of books that a library buys. They're monographs that a library should have available and will often have available multi-user. So students uh, not turning to the library and looking for them in their first year was a bit disappointing. Uh, so really helping first year students to acquire those strategies that we saw later in their careers making uh, a, a really good, you know, allowing them to make really good choices. It's really helpful to remember that uh, students don't know uh, all that we know in terms of how to buy books cheaply. Uh, so helping them with that. And then just, uh, we need to continue to study the changing role of books in research, learning and teaching on campus. We know very little, and uh, it really is important to know this uh, type of, uh, type of uh, information and that, Course reserves, uh, ways of uh, supporting uh, learning are very important uh, in the library uh, world and that we need to keep uh, understanding those more and more. And thank you to all the students. Uh, this was a really useful uh, exercise. Thank you, Craig and Charles. Um, we have uh, one question in the Q&A so far. Uh, can you talk about what led you to group the races and ethnicities together rather than separating them out into distinct groups for your analysis? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's one I always struggle with. I will say that we haven't definitively settled on that for our final set of analyses. Um, but it is the case, for example, that sometimes so few students identify as being members of certain groups that it's hard to run the analysis with them included in, in the analysis. So an example that would be um, uh, like Native American students are a, a much smaller group on our campus than some other underrepresented groups. And it felt really bad to me to think about removing them from an analyses altogether, um, as opposed to at the very least finding some way to um, um, group them with other students that typically are more, more likely to be stressed financially and more likely to encounter certain forms of bias and discrimination than other students. So at the very least that was like a, a, a way to keep them in the sample, um, but it's not necessarily uh, a satisfying way. It, it reduces the nuance and it um, is, is a unfortunate um, decision you have to sometimes make in order to um, run certain kinds of analyses, but we absolutely will pay attention to that nuance and other forms of analysis. I, I think you're muted, Elizabeth. Thank you. I can't blame it on a cat, unfortunately. <laughs> Mine's asleep behind me. Um, we have a comment in the Q&A. Um, Illinois is canceling their Amazon.com contract for state institutions because Amazon is not complying with the procurement pr principles the state has in place. How can we advocate for Amazon ready orders under these circumstances? I, mean, I, I, I think that uh, you know Amazon is a big brand name, but I think it's really important to understand what Amazon has created. Uh, and what the students are looking for is a very um, easy way of comparing pricing um, uh, uh, for new and used books. Um, and there are other services that will do that, like Bookfinder, for example, searching across multiple different uh, sources. Um, another thing is the speed. 
what was really clear to us is that students want to get these books into their hands quickly because they're often on deadlines. So it's not so much about Amazon as such, it's about the, um, the, the, the function it's providing for students who still rely substantially on print um, and how they can get the books cheaply and immediately in their hands. Thank you. One thing I would say just quickly is uh, I, I know that many uh, of the uh, participants in this session will actually have university presses reporting into libraries um, just because of the sheer numbers. And these are uh, presses that are operating a lot on an anecdote and anything you can do to help the presses actually turn anecdotes into data will be incredibly uh, useful for them in very trying times. So just a plea. Thank you. And with that, we're going to move on to our next presentation. Uh, Don't pay for free updating cost of use for the age of open access presented by Heather P. Vavar, co-founder of Our Research. Over to you, Heather. Thanks. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? Oh, we can awesome. hear you. Okay, awesome. Great. Thanks, everybody. And I'm really happy to be here. Um, I don't see the green. Let me try to share that again because I don't see the green square we have all known to come and love. There we go. Okay, so my name's Heather Pivovar and I am part of the team behind Unsub. So we're a nonprofit company called Our Research and we've been, we're really small, but we've been around for about eight years. Um, our mission is to help make scholarship be more open and accessible. Um, as quickly as possible. So that transition is obviously happening, but we'd like to help it happen sooner. So we, um, you might not have heard of our nonprofit's name, our research, but you might have heard of, oh, I should zoom out, of our um, main product that's been most successful so far, which is Unpaywall. So it's a database of open access links. It's one of the tools that has a free browser extension uh, to help you find open access. It's also powering the links behind Scopus and Web of Science and those other browser extensions. Intentions, um, to help find open access. Also, if you don't have it turned on in your link resolver on paywall, you should, because it will help your patrons get to um, open access copies of the paper faster and help your ILL system not need to deal with them. So I'm happy to answer questions about that later uh, in the questions section if you want. But the reason that I'm bringing it up is that our focus on open access is what led us to make this tool Unsub, um, which I'll give you a quick demo of. And particularly, I'm going to focus on one of the innovations that we've done in Unsub, which is to slightly uh, refine cost per use, the cost per use calculation. So um, with no further ado, here is Unsub. That's what you've been looking at. So this is real data from a large US university. Um, and this is available as a free demo on unsub.org. So you can go there right now and play along um, or else you can subscribe to your own copy of Unsub and upload your own data. And I'm happy to talk about that later too, if you want. Okay, so um, I'm going to start by drawing your attention to this second bar right here. What we're looking at is this university, we're looking at their Elsevier big deal. And we're imagining what if they canceled their Elsevier big deal? Actually, you know what, let me go back one, one step. Um, I'm not a salesperson, does it show? Um, be and I'm not trying to sell you on this, but I am trying to help you take it seriously. So Unsub has been used by, it launched about a a uh, year and a half ago, you might have heard of it because it has been used by a bunch of libraries already um, to either cancel their big deals or um, refine their selections on what they do want to subscribe to a la carte. So the SUNY system, uh, Virginia, North Carolina, and so on. So um, a bunch. So uh, it's already in good production use. So if you've heard of it, uh, now you're getting a demo. So um, this is a large uh, US university, I'm not going to name their Elsevier big deal information. And we're, what Unsub does is it models, what if they cancel their big deal and subscribe to nothing else to start with? What does that look like? And so we look out five years and we say, well, based on their counter data, um, and we think that about 37% of all uses um, to their Elsevier big deal content can actually be fulfilled via open access at the time of use. So at the time someone wants to read it, it will be available open access right then, 37% of all uses. 
In addition to that, based on their perpetual access information, we think another 11% is available as a, in, in their back file at the time of use. So over the next five years, that back file, that post-termination access will become less and less relevant, but overall we think it will be relevant about to 11% um, of uses, leaving only about 52% of uses that we're saying are delayed or inconvenient or potentially turnaways if the people don't do ILL. So uh, what they'll actually do, as we know, is Google for another paper or ask around uh, someone in their lab, talk to the author, uh, maybe SciHub, and maybe do an interlibrary loan request. So one of the things that Unsub does is help to model and predict what would the interlibrary loan demand be in this case where this um, university canceled their Elsevier big deal. And so we've looked at the literature and it looks like about, it's hard to tell, uh, but about one out of every 20 times someone tries to get a journal article and they can't, they make an ILL request. And so that's a parameter here in um, this 5% is that one out of every 20 times. And we think um, we again did a literature review and it looks like about fulfilling an ILL request, request costs on average $17. If it costs less for your university, you could change that or more, you could change that too. But using these default values, this 52% of accesses that are not immediately available via open access or backfile. This 52% of those accesses, about one in 20 of them will be ILL and that will cost $17. And that means we estimate this university will spend about $390,000 a year, every year for the next five years on ILL. Now, again, that's not actually static because since this back file starts off useful and gets less useful, the ILL will actually start off smaller and then get bigger over the next five years. Um, but just for simplicity, we're just doing a snapshot um, average over that five years. So um, this university paid about $2 million for their big deal. So that would mean they're um, actually only paying about 17% of what they were paying before. Half of the content is still uh, legally um, immediately available at the time of use and the other half um, can be obtained by ILL sort of as often as people want to request it with the model with the parameters built in. So that's a bit about unsub um, setup. And then here's the part where we get to cost for use. So what if this university wants to save money but they don't need to save that much money. So they'd rather spend some more money and in exchange for some more convenient use. So we model that by you can just sort of click and hold modeling to more and subscribing to more and more journals. So let me click and hold it till I've subscribed to 100 journals, let's say. Okay, now the way that um, I think we've all done that for a long time is to order journals uh, by cost effectiveness as a first step. Now, certainly that's not the only step and some presenters today have talked uh, in good detail about the other important pieces of data to bring to the puzzle and there absolutely are, but cost per use is an important um, initial piece. So this, so that brings me to this part of this diagram right here. What this, each dot is a journal in this diagram and they're ordered from the most cost effective or the ones with the lowest cost per use here on the left to the ones with the highest cost per use here on the right. And then the ones with ridiculously high cost per use are down here in the gutter. Um, and the bit that we're actually here to talk about with the uh, half our remaining time is what kind of cost per use calculation are we using in Unsub? And it's one that's a little bit more detailed than and a little bit more enhanced than some of the other, uh, than the standard cost per use. And I will now show you how. So let me click on this dot that is cell um, and walk you through it. So there's three enhancements in the cost per use calculation that we do. Um, the first is that we, for the cost part of cost per use, it's traditionally just been the cost of subscribing to that journal. But that sort of implies the cost of not subscribing to the journal is zero. And it's not because you actually have to fulfill the ILL requests that come if you don't subscribe to the journal. So we actually use the net cost, the net subscription cost, which is the base subscription cost minus what we think it will cost if you just um, do fulfill those 
um, uses via ILL. Now, again, it's that at that usage at the one out of 20 rate. So um, for this journal, that actually means the net subscription subscription cost is negative. Now, this is only this does happen sometimes. Um, it only happens for really big schools that have a lot of use for a journal whose subscription price is relatively low. So when the net subscription cost is negative, um, it means you should definitely subscribe to this. You shouldn't try to fulfill it just via ILL. Uh, so that's the first enhancement is that we include the ILL cost um, in that cost uh, to make the net subscription cost. The second enhancement is that for the cost per use, for use, we don't just include downloads, we also include citations and authorships. Now we do this because we've heard that librarians have done this in spreadsheets for years, um, uh, sort of ad hoc, and so we're trying to bring it more officially into the equation um, by doing something that, again, libraries have often done in spreadsheets, which is to um, make citations and authorships count as downloads. So we give them a weight, and by default, we give us each citation a weight of 10 downloads and each authorship a weight of a weight of 100 downloads. So what that means is for this institution, for this journal, cell, how many times did was there an author affiliated with this institution that published a paper in cell? Well, in this case, it was four times, four papers it, uh, that year had an author that was with this university. So we multiply by the, uh, by 100 and count that as 400 downloads. And you could think of those as they're really important downloads or they're downloads that are, that uh, uh, it, it's, uh, signaling a value of the journal beyond just um, to the to your uh, institution beyond just what the downloads are showing. So anyway, uh, the use that we consider in Unsub is this combination of download citations and authorships. Now in Unsub, if you don't want to consider citations and authorships, you could change these weights, the 10 and the 100 to be zero, or you could make them anything else you want. Similarly, you can take the ILL cost out by making the ILL fulfillment cost be zero. Um, and that gets you back closer to the original um, calculations. Okay, so I said there were three enhancements. The last one is that you shouldn't pay for free. And so um, in, in a cost per use calculation, in our opinion, you should only include the uses that you could only get if you subscribe to the journal. So that means you should not include the uses that you could get um, without subscribing to the journal. So you should not include the uses that are already available open access or in your back file. So we actually subtract those out of the uses to get just the paywalled uses. And then we divide paywalled uses, sorry, we divide the net subscription cost by the paywalled uses to get the cost per use. Uh, so those are the three enhancements, the uh, including ILL, including citations and authorships, and subtracting out what's available uh, for free. And so cell is kind of a weird example um, because it is this negative cost per use. Um, here's, uh, let me click on it. Uh, uh, a, a different one um, at random. So here's, you can see some of those calculations uh, for a more normal journal. Okay, now in my um, abstract, when I submitted it, I said we we're also gonna do some slice and dices comparing this uh, net cost per paid use, we originally called it, but it's acronym, that acronym, if you spell it out, looks like Nikki Poo, which we didn't think was ever gonna catch on. So that's why we're now just calling it enhanced cost per use. Anyway, to compare this enhanced cost per use to um, existing cost per use and showing some great graphs and having some great statistical analysis. So instead, I am here to make it safe for everyone whose last year um, has meant they're not meeting all of the high hopes that they'd met uh, set for themselves, because I don't have some of those statistical graphs that I was hoping to, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but I do have some graphs, so let me show them to you. I should say, in Unsub, you can change all these parameters, you can make new scenarios, you can play around by subscribing or unsubscribing to things in this model that aren't just cost per use, because again, it's important, um, your faculty's opinion and so on uh, is important things that you might wanna work in here beside just the analytics. The main point I'm trying to show you is you can also export all this data as a spreadsheet. If you export it as a spreadsheet and bring it into Google, um, 
uh, sheets, for example, it looks like this. Okay, so that's what you get. Now, if you um, go to your scenario and do some of those changes that I said, like making the cost of ILL be zero and making the weights, here's where the weights are, the 10 be zero um, and the weight for authorship be zero and turning off all the types of open access and not including back file. Then you can export a version of it that has a cost per use that's much more similar to the traditional cost per use. So I did that and then using VLOOKUP, which if you don't know how to use VLOOKUP, you should learn how to use VLOOKUP. You can do it and it's not too hard. Um, I merged those spreadsheets together. And then we can plot the old cost per use or something that's really quite similar to it to the new cost per use. Now, if all those enhancements we did didn't do anything or anything effective, what you would see is all these um, dots just on a line because old cost per use would equal new cost per use. But we don't, we see them scattered um, in various places. Now this graph is, um, this graph is hard to read because it's in log scale. And so these outliers um, really demand your attention. And so instead of we put it on log scale, you can see that there is indeed, uh, even in a log log plot, some spread. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's why I want to show you there. And, but, um, but for some cases you actually care about, oh, that's my time. For some cases you actually care about the cost per use. In other cases, you just care about rank. So here I did a graph of this just based on the cost per use rank, doing it the old way versus the new way. And you can still see there's some difference there. And then if we do it with by journal name, you can see and actually you can see it a little more here. Um, medical journals tend to do quite well with this new cost per use with our default in this large university with the med school. I think that citations and authorships driving that. Down here, and I know I'm going really fast, I need to wrap it up. The fact that the red dots here are higher than the blue dots and the red dots are old cost per you rank, that means the, the new algorithm is making them rank higher compared to here where it's ranking lower. You don't really need to understand this. You can just get the general gist that down here, there's some um, journals, for example, that have a large amount of open access. And so that's driving some of the difference over here. And for these bunch of journals right in the middle, it really doesn't make much difference. So if this seems like something that's compelling to you, I really encourage you to check it out for your own university. And again, you don't need to use unsub for this, obviously. You could do, now that you know this new cost per use calculation, you can calculate it yourself in Excel, for example. Um, yeah, and, and play around with the weights and see which are the, the compelling differences for you and what that means for your collection decisions. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, first, for annual usage uh, that is adjusted by authorship, does this include any authorship among co-authors or corresponding author only? Yeah, uh, it includes any authorship. One note is that corresponding authorship is not very well documented by publishers in general, and so encourage your publishers to make that metadata openly available. <laughs> and then a second question, um, have you considered the cost impact of a shrinking pool of academic suppliers as institutions shed subscriptions? How does the ILL charge change if the document has to be obtained from the publisher or from commercial document suppliers? Yeah, it's a great question. And we have a number of people who are who are looking at changing the ILL cost from $17 to be $25 or $30, for example, to model um, replacing their ILL either completely or um, in large part by document delivery. And so you could use Unsub or whatever other tools you use to model that. And that I think might be the future, is, it enables a future where we're not all dependent on everyone getting everything in case nobody gets nothing. Great, let's see. Looks like we have one more question. Um, yep. Can you explain your definition of open access a bit more? Are you talking yeah. about journals that allow authors to pay to do open access for their articles or an OA journal um, with all articles free? 
That's a great question. I have, it's a very, it could be a very long answer. So let me just tell you what UNSUV is doing here. And that is we're including in everything that is legally available for free, broadly to be open access. And then we're breaking it out into different types and letting you turn some parts of that on or off. So for example, we include ResearchGate as open access. Now that's maybe contentious and maybe your campus does not want to include that. So in that case, you could turn ResearchGate off. You could turn non-peer reviewed versions off. So you only would include peer reviewed versions. You could return turn off bronze OA. That's the kind that is not um, openly licensed. And so publishers could take it down at, um, at whim. Yeah. Then a final question, what beyond Elsevier is included in your big deal analysis? Yeah, great question. So first I wanna make sure it's clear, uh, UNSUP is built to really help with big deals, but it can also help with other things than big deals. So the nomenclature and stuff is big deals, but I, hopefully you can see how you can use it for a wide number of things. Right now we are, are doing the five, I think the five biggest publishers are the ones in most demand, Elsevier, Wiley, Springer Nature, Taylor Francis, and Sage. We're planning to roll, and frankly, those are the ones that have been, as I said, most demanded. There's not much appetite for this for smaller publishers. I think people have already saved most of the money they think they can with smaller publishers, and I think they're probably right. Um, but we are nonetheless planning to roll out support for all other publishers uh, later this year. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move on, move on to our final presentation now. Um, it, our final presentation is data and method as assessment terministic screens, why improvement is lost, presented by Aaron Noland, Director of Planning and Assessment at James Madison University Libraries. Hi, folks. Thank you uh, for, for being here and um, for your attention. I know being the last, the last person here, and, and I want to say thanks to <clears throat> the conveners and organizers. This was supposed to be in December. We had some uh, health issues in my family, so I wasn't able to, to present then. And so happy to be here now and, and excited to talk about this. So a, a different uh, approach, a different sort of um, focus uh, and, and kind of a dot topic than, than most of the presentations today. But if we jump into it and start to start with um, the assessment, uh, an assessment process, this is the assessment process that uh, James Madison University Center for Assessment and Research Study uses. And it's a, a widely respected um, assessment process, but, but the, the process that you use, that you're familiar with, uh, the assessment cycle, it, they all map on um, very similar things. You have learning outcomes, mapping those to programming or activities, uh, designing, selecting, whatever the case may be, <clears throat> your instruments or your methods of data collection, implementing, running your programs or activities, making sure that, that you're doing what it is that you're purporting to do, gathering data, analyzing it, doing data management, <clears throat> and then hopefully using results uh, to make decisions about your programs and activities. And that's really uh, why we engage in assessment. These, these other pieces of the cycle have some intrinsic value. There's a, a lot to be learned as you go along, but really what we're trying to do is is continuous improvement or to, uh, to make sure that we're actually achieving the things that we're setting out to do. The, the cycle, however, um, oftentimes is, is front-loaded um, when we talk about these things. So the purpose of uh, my talk today is to really take a communication approach to this. My background is in um, speech communication and, and framing and, the, and these sort of things. So I wanna talk about intended and received messages and then get into um, some, some theoretical framework from Kenneth Burke that I think can, can help us uh, do a little bit better as we frame up uh, assessment messaging. And it's important to point out that what I'm talking about here um, is, is when, we, when we're talking to audiences that aren't assessment professionals. When we come to these conferences, we can, we can talk in any one of those boxes uh, to each other and it's great and it's compelling and, and we can wrestle with the challenges that we all face uh, in those spaces. But when we're talking with, with folks who aren't assessment professionals, it can sort of create a glaze over effect. And, and I'm sure many of you have experienced that. So I thought what I might try and do is, is think about some common assessment messages um, that, that we send or that we say and how they might be received 
um, given context. So the bias, uh, to state my bias here, is I think that received messages matter more uh, when we're talking about assessment to, to non-assessment professionals, when we're trying to get buy-in or we're trying to, to establish partnerships and collaboration. So uh, whether you agree with that or not, it doesn't really matter. I think we can we can all sort of take some take some stuff from this, no matter what. So, we might say rigorous methods um, allow us to draw better conclusions. They, they improve our ability to draw conclusions. It's great. It's true. That might be heard as assessment is all about process. Those are very different messages. Another example. If we don't have a valid data collection process, we can't be confident in any intervention that we plan. People might hear that as, you don't trust my expertise to know how to make changes about uh, things that I'm a domain expert in. We might say a, a theory of change helps us structure an implementation. And people might hear, oh my gosh, we have to document everything. This is busy work and paperwork. And we might say the data doesn't justify that change. And people might hear, you think you know my domain better than I do. And so uh, th these things are intentionally polemic so as to make the point that what we say and, and what gets received, there may be um, some pretty substantial gaps there. And so what are the opportunities that we have to close those gaps to, uh, to really establish um, strong partnerships rather than engaging um, in, in unintentionally adversarial or defensive uh, relationships. And so to really dig in and explore this, Kenneth Burke's Pentad, um, which, which, was, which is, uh, has been around for a long time. If, if you're a, a composition or a literary critic, you're probably familiar with, uh, with Burke. But really this, the Pentad and, and Burke's thesis in general is that, and so we're applying it here to assessment, he wasn't writing about assessment, but that communication about assessment reveals, reveals our, our motivation. So why it is that we actually engage in assessment. So he takes a, a critical approach. And so he the, the Pentad is a method of understanding motivation and it's comprised of uh, five components. The first is the act. Um, so, so what is being done, what was done, activities. The second is the context. Of, of the acts or the, the set of activities. The third is the agent, the person or persons performing the act. Next is the agency, which is sort of how, how the agent goes about performing the act. And finally, the purpose, which is the reasons for performing the act. And so this is the, this is the Pentad and Burke theorizes that uh, the, the, the ratio of what is emphasized in discourse um, so if act and agent are emphasized, then that reveals something about the motivation that we have um, in, in structuring the communication that we are. So this is a way of understanding discourses about specific things rather than uh, just describing them. So if we apply the Pentad to assessment discourse, we can sort of see, okay, the act, we're, we're evaluating something, um, be it performance uh, or some other metric, whatever you're interested in evaluating or assessing um, in a progress toward an established goal or toward a, a learning objective or a programmatic objective. The scene, it might be instruction, it might be programming, it might be an activity, it might be engagement with a maker space. <clears throat> Agents, we're talking here mostly about students and, and probably library staff. Agency, so how we go about um, uh, gathering data, uh, this is the data collection piece. Any number of things here, uh, the, the presentation before, we could be looking at uh, 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 data on, on finance data. <clears throat> Why do we engage in this? Maybe to demonstrate value, maybe because we have to, uh, maybe because it's uh, required by our university or uh, our accreditor, but hopefully uh, we're also, or hopefully primarily, we're, we're engaged in it because we want to improve uh, our processes and programming and, and be able to, to establish progress towards our goals more effectively. So if we think about assessment discourse, the, the large 
sort of um, global discourse about assessment. And we were to, uh, to try and figure out which one or two of these are privileged in assessment discourse, we would probably be looking at agency. We would probably see a whole lot of literature on agency. That's what, uh, that's what most assessment uh, literature is about, the, the context around agency. And so if we think about that as understanding uh, a means for our motivation to engage in assessment, then some of those received messages become obvious. They become uh, totally um, self-explanatory. Doesn't mean that that's necessarily uh, our motivation, but how, 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 how the way in which we communicate impacts how we're understood and it impacts the decisions that people make about motivation. And so Burke's, Burke's pen type can, can give us some really good insight about what are we spending the most time talking about and what are the implications of that? What does it say about how people might be able to interpret our motives for engaging in discourse? And so Burke talks about, um, in the context of the Pentad, uh, uh, terministic screens. And really here he's talking about how language sort of defines, regenerates or generates meaning and reveals our motives. And I just, I really love this, this image um, as, as sort of a, a visual picture of how language can um, sort of deflect a uh, specific reality. So if we think about the, the language that we use as sort of being the, the, the figure dressed in all black here and turning uh, the man's head as he's walking along. So our terminology reflects uh, our version of reality. It selects a specific reality to focus on and deflects others. So th this picture I think illustrates how, how terminology or language functions to do all three of those things. And so Burke as a critical theorist takes it another step and talks about how language actually exposes our desire to, to really control things uh, and, and shape people's perception. And I'm not here today to tell you that uh, assessment professionals are trying to do that. Uh, I think the, the beauty of critical theory, particularly when we apply it to something uh, like assessment is that it really can, can help us sharpen up what we're trying to do. So if we go back to uh, our assessment process where we started um, at the beginning, we can see if we're focused down here on, uh, on all of these things about data, data collection, data gathering, uh, instruments, statistical analyses, um, charts and graphs, um, data management, then that becomes the reality that we select. That becomes the thing that we want to talk about. And as a result, it deflects from the things at the top, the why, why we engage uh, in assessment processes to begin with. And so Burke's terministic screens and Pintad would tell us that uh, our motives are, are revealed by uh, an overemphasis in discourses about assessment on these things sort of at the bottom of the cycle to be really concerned with that, that, that that's actually what we care about as assessment professionals. So we're, we're not really um, concerned about improvement or um, making sure that we have strong learning objectives or programmatic objectives and that we're intentionally mapping those objectives back to what it is that we're doing and how we're making decisions. But really we're talking about uh, being, being overly concerned with data. So one of the things that critical theory often doesn't do is the next step of, okay, so what do we do about this problem? If we acknowledge that this problem exists, what can we do? Well, the first thing um, that I wanna say is that terministic screens work both ways. So if we only talk about improvement, then we sort of do this uh, disservice to all of the, the other stuff, all of the process, all of the, the facilitating conditions and steps that allow us to get to improvement. So we don't want to, to diminish the work of assessment. Uh, so we, need to, we need to sort of walk the line. And so my recommendation is that we start with and continue to focus on the why. Why are we engaged in this? Not, uh, not how we're going to do it, but why are we even um, trying to engage in assessment in the first place. And if our only reason is accreditation or reporting, then maybe we should call it something else. 
maybe we should call it uh, is data gathering or data reporting so as not to contaminate assessment with all these other things um, that aren't really assessment because they're not really improvement driven. So we can also move from the simple to complex, but it's really hard to go uh, the other direction. So if we start in the weeds, if we start with um, complex method, complex data analysis, data management, and then try and talk about why, people get bogged down and it's harder to go back to the simple. But if we start with the why, it becomes easier to move to the simple because that why creates a sort of orienting um, uh, beacon for us. So it's a better way to frame why those, those process pieces, why data collection, why good instrumentation, why good data collection and, and uh, implementation fidelity matter. Uh, we're not trying to, to say they matter for the sake of, of just their intrinsic value because it, that may not be compelling. And as I said, it serves as a beacon. We, we can continue to come back to the why. If we start there, we get buy-in about the why of assessment. When, when things get uh, complex and messy in uh, implementation fidelity or in data analysis or data management, or when, when data comes back and it, it doesn't tell us that we're doing things exactly as we should, then we can return to this sort of anchor uh, of the why that we're engaging in assessment in the first place. Okay, and that uh, brings my, my presentation to an end. So I'm gonna stop the share here and we'll take some questions. Thank you, Aaron. And if, again, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function and I will read the questions for the speaker in the audience. Almost five o'clock. <laughs> the uh, it's like it's like when you say and when you're teaching, this is the last thing, and then ask for questions. I personally really appreciated um, your talk, and I really appreciate the way that you wrapped it up at the end by reminding us that if we are focusing on but that, that the screens go both ways and that if we're, you know, if the, it's easy to lose track of the why in in emphasizing the importance of, of the process and the rigor and, and all of those things that I think we've become a culture to do, um, particularly if you're in an institution where assessment isn't something that is well established or isn't something that is um, valued across the board. So I, I really appreciated that reminder and looking forward to referring back to your slides. Um, it looks like a bunch of questions have come in while I've been talking, so let me refer to them now. Um, let's see. One person says, this is a fasc fascinating presentation. Thank you. I'm interested in hearing you talk more about how this has changed your conversation with colleagues and users. And uh, do you have some examples you can share? Yeah, so in um, uh, in our library, we we don't have uh, yet an, an assessment plan. And actually, I'm, I'm now in a, a different role. Um, and overseeing us at the assessment function. Um, but I think the, the biggest change that it's had um, that, that I've tried to bring to this is not talking about assessment, um, not starting there, just, just sort of not even using that as, as a jumping off point, but using uh, an entry point of like, if you could, if you could understand something or, or if, if, if you could answer one question that would help you, what would you answer? What do you not know that you wanna know? Or, or what program or activity are you like, is this working? Should we continue doing this? Um, so, so starting with that, with that conversation, I think has helped a lot. And so then the, the projects become assessment projects without starting as assessment projects. So, so that it opens up a space, I think, um, for folks to be able to, to be curious rather than feel like they're being evaluated. Um, so I hope that answers question, um, at least to some degree. A, a couple of examples, we have a, a large scale online learning institute. Um, we, we've engaged in a, a pretty extensive assessment project um, of that. And, and we're actually doing, um, I'm not leading this project, but in our library, we're doing um, a, a sort of assessment of, of our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, or, or actually a pre-assessment, what should we do? So 
those are a couple of examples that that starting with the why has helped. Thank you. Let's see. Um, how would you approach administrative individuals who primarily speak in accreditation terms? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I am an administrative individual. Um, I, I think uh, I think we have to do accreditation. So you know we're we're not going to get rid of that. Uh, and so I think the more compelling way to approach that question is to separate the two. So let let's do what accreditation asks us to do. And if assessment, um, research, and and data gathering can can provide us data and information that helps accreditation, great. But let's not try and do these things um, that are actually for very different purposes together. Uh, so how would I approach uh, an administrative um, person who only wants to speak in those terms? I think I would, I would do accreditation work as accreditation work and, and try and carve out space for, for some assessment work independent of the accreditation lens. I recognize that but that may be challenging as market as capacity goes. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of folks who um, wanted to express their appreciation for your introduction of the idea of intended versus received messages. Um, another person indicated that they felt this overlapped really nicely with Jeremy Bueller's presentation on culture of inquiry at the previous library assessment conference um, in 2018. Um, another person asked, um, did you receive assessment literature to validate your assertion that assessment discourse is more biased towards method and data rather than the why? Uh, I, I didn't do a sort of a meta-analysis of the literature, no, um, but, but I've been reading this literature for uh, a number of years, taken coursework in the area, and, and, and my claim isn't, um, isn't sort of a condemnation of the field. It's much more uh, about um, how, how uh, a way to sort of get us out of our out of patterns, right? So I think that's the that's the really nice thing about critical theory is it it gives you that kind of jolt and helps you sort of do some self examination. So um, if the if the claim is or if the question is does the does the library assessment literature actually favor this? I, I wouldn't I wouldn't feel confident in saying empirically that I could answer that question. Yes, I I also. I uh, feel pretty confident that there's there's a, a whole bunch of stuff on that. Thank you. As, As there, there should be. <laughs> um, more comments are coming in, but I wanted to make sure that we have an opportunity to open up um, open up the floor to any comments or questions for any of the presenters. So as those come in, um, I'll go ahead and pass on the remainder of questions to Aaron. Um, I have a couple of folks, um, again, thanking you for your presentation, and I see that you're working on responding to a comment that I will read out loud as well. Someone asked, do you think that part of the issue might be that we don't actually use our data to make improvements enough? And, and I was I was going to answer that because I thought you were going in a different direction. I, so I'll just say yes, I think I'll, definitely. Okay. Um, and again, at this point, we're going to open it up to questions from um, for any of our presenters. I don't. I believe that not all of our presenters are still on the call, um, but I would welcome um, questions for anyone who remains on the call or any questions that the presenters would like to pose to each other. Since I know you did not have access to the Q and A function um, throughout this call. Okay, so I've got one. Has there, um, does anybody, has anybody done a study on how much Sci-Hub usage there is on their campus and how it affects their interlibrary loan numbers? And any of the presenters, you're welcome to answer and, if, and attendees, you're welcome to put it in the chat. I'm not seeing any responses, so I'm guessing that 
the group is no, the answer is no. Um, but one person said in the chat that they would be interested in knowing this as well. So perhaps there's room for a presentation at the next library assessment conference. Are there any final questions for any of our presenters? Perhaps I'll move on to our final announcements and if there are additional questions, I'll pass on. Uh, there's a, another comment in the Q&A. Um, this comment question is for Aaron. Um, I've been trying to collect why questions from staff to initiate or create assessment projects, but this has not been successful so far. Do you have any advice for this person? I was muted and I did uh, catch myself before I started talking. Um, keep doing it. I, I think that it may be off-putting to folks initially um, uh, I think just keep uh, keep genuinely at, uh, trying to foster uh, curiosity and and provide support for folks. One of the things that that I did very early is is I had previous working relationship with with I, I joined libraries from elsewhere in the university and had a previous working relationship with one of the people in the libraries who I knew had um, had some experience and some expertise in assessment and so we did a project uh, together and made it so, sort of visible, um, low stakes and visible, it grew um, and became more complex as it went on. But I think I think trying to find an early win and talking about how the why question led to whatever it is that sort of um, comes from it and sharing that out through, you know, if you have a management group or or in whatever your, your appropriate informal organizational network would be is a really good way to sort of um, deflate the stakes right i think that's a i think that's a good strategy thank you um, i have a couple more questions many of the presenters have completed research in the pandemic age have you found the frameworks of your of your libraries to be resilient and for your libraries to possibly emerge stronger post pandemic Um, I can say that I think we've been forced to think very creatively, um, but I think uh, that's kind of widespread. Um, I do think for uh, my presentation, at least uh, with the reference on call service, we're probably going to have to reframe it because I just can't imagine anyone wanting to go in an enclosed space with strangers anytime soon. Uh, so maybe it'll be more of a Zoom open office hours type thing. Uh, that's something I can foresee happening. I think a possibly related question also in Q&A. For those who studied services pre-COVID, are there plans to redo these studies in 2021 or later to see how the pandemic might have affected the way users use or think about those services? So interlibrary loan, document delivery, reference questions, et cetera. I can say that we, we do plan to reassess some stuff around document delivery going forward. We're designing our own set of campus-wide surveys that will probably deploy cyclically and we'll have some questions in there that revisit document delivery, um, especially since the pandemic has really made document delivery even more important for some people. Seeing enough nodding heads that I wondered for a moment if my laptop was actually moving. <laughs> so it seems like there's a, a consensus around the need to, you know, revisit the things that or revisit the things that we think we thought that we knew um, or that we even that we measured in the in the midst of the pandemic. Um, I think our final question is uh, for, for everyone. Have you found yourself abandoning your traditional assessment plan due to COVID or quarantine issues? And how are you addressing program or plan abandonment at your institutions? I, I do uh, strategic planning for, for our library as well, and or I, I don't do it. I 
facilitated. Um, and I think this question is a really important one and, and I think you should abandon um, these things. Uh, plans are, are living, breathing things. There's not like a, a originalist sort of constitutional question here. They should, they should be dynamic and certainly in the, in the context that we're in, stopping things that aren't immediately core to um, what everyone's doing given, given cognitive load and everything else makes a ton of sense. So if uh, assessment processes are laborious and not easily um, sort of added on to operations, then I think it totally makes sense. And, and it seems to me that the pandemic will, we will be in a different enough place post pandemic that those questions may shift substantially. And so you may be in a, a position to sort of refresh the questions and assessment plan that you're asking anyway. In my opinion, assessing just to assess is not worth it. Um, <laughs> so it it's beneficial for us to just, you know, sidestep and uh, readjust our priorities as necessary. Thank you all. Um, so at this point, I want to thank you, thank our presenters and our audience again. Um, this is the time in the program where we'd like to promote our sister conference, uh, LibPMC, which will be held virtually November 2nd through 4th, 2021. Uh, we have a slide up with the information and the link is going to go in the chat. Um, again, PowerPoint slides and session recordings and papers from today's session will be made available on the conference website. Um, we encourage folks to continue the discussion on Twitter uh, using the hashtag LAC20 or via the ARLSS email group. Um, and again, you can see up on the screen, our next session will be held Wednesday, March 17th on the theme of teaching and learning, teaching, learning and value. Uh, this will begin at 1 p.m. Eastern and registration is now open. The link will be in chat. Thank you again to all of our presenters and to our attendees. It's been a great session.